I'm waiting on the go ahead from Andrew that we are ready to begin. He stepped out of the boardroom. Okay. We are good to go. He might be over the control room. Okay. We I just got the thumbs up. We are good to go. Good afternoon. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, May 17th, 2022. This evening's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. May I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by the Open Meetings Act, as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland, General Provisions Article 3-305, B1 and B9, to 1, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. So moved, Mac. Thank you, May. Is there a second? Second, Hager. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Ms. Causey? Ms. Beck? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The motion carries. The first item for closed session is personnel matters, and for oh. that I call on Ms. Thank you. Hey, 
Board members, please take your seat. We're going to proceed momentarily. Hi, Mrs. Murray. Welcome. Hi, Christian. Good to see you. Well, your image. <laughs> Hi, buddy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? But the whole room can hear. Fine. We're about to get started. So board members can please be in their seats and those attending remotely can be ready. Ms. Gover, are we ready? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Henn. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, May 17th, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mr. Christian Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the May 17th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are no additions or changes to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date.
Next on the agenda is a special order of business recognizing Ms. Catherine Nora Murray. At this time, Ms. Murray will be joining us virtually, and I ask Ms. Samantha Warfel to please join Vice Chair Rod McMillian and Dr. Williams at the front of the dais. And Mr. McMillian, I turn it over to you. Good evening. Resolution 2022-10. Whereas Ms. Catherine Nora Murray has served the students of Baltimore County Public Schools with honor and distinction since 2014. And whereas Mrs. Murray's dedicated leadership has made positive contributions to student leadership, service learning, and volunteer programs in BCPS. And whereas in honor of Mrs. Murray's steadfast advocacy and innovative approach to increasing participation and diversity in student leadership programs, her work to establish the new Baltimore County Junior Council for middle school students, and her efforts to implement implicit bias training for students, she was named the Maryland Association of Student Council's Regional Advisor of the Year. And whereas Ms. Murray's collaboration with staff across schools and central offices has consistently resulted in positive outcomes for student leaders and BCPS and ensured all students have an opportunity to reach their fullest potential and can in turn empower their peers to leverage their voices. And whereas in recognition of Ms. Murray's profound and life-changing impact on student leaders, insightfulness and dedication to students to building student leadership capacity, therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education herewith assembled in regular session on the 17th day of May and the year 2022 expresses to Ms. Nora Murray on behalf of the citizens of this county our deepest appreciation and gratitude for her service and be it further resolved that the Board herewith extends its best wishes for her good health, happiness, and continued success. Thank you. Fellow board members, I move that the board accept the resolution as read by Mr. McMillan. May I have a second? Second, Thomas. Young lady. All in favor? Any opposed? Aye. The board is unanimous. Congratulations, Ms. Murray. Please bring remarks on behalf of Ms. Murray. Thank you everyone so much. Um, I know Ms. Murray is watching virtually and I'm, I'm so certain that she is so immensely grateful for all of your kind words um, as well as appreciation and support. Um, she was thoughtful enough to provide me with her remarks so that I could relay them on her behalf. So I'll go ahead and do that now. So on behalf of Ms. Murray, she says, good evening, board chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillan, Dr. Williams, and a special hello to our SMOB, Mr. Thomas. I want to take a moment and thank you for the acknowledgement of this achievement. And here she very kindly thanks me for submitting the recognition, um, which she requires you know, no thanks needed at all, at all. Um, it was my pleasure. But she says that it is an honor to serve BCPS in the development of student leadership and to be recognized by the State Leadership Program, the Maryland Association of Student Councils for the work we do with our students. I believe we still have opportunities to grow by incorporating a more diverse group of leaders and seizing the opportunity to reach and engage more students. The work is never done, and we always look back to see what we can do better and engage more students. I have been blessed to work with some passionate students beginning in sixth grade who have stayed involved and today lead our students. They give me so much of themselves to encourage student voice and provide outlets for students to share concerns and how to work on the issues within their buildings and at the district level. Our student leaders are passionate and dedicated to creating a safe and secure environment for all. They serve on focus groups and committees sharing student feedback and concerns. It is an honor to watch them grow as it leads them to be productive and civically engaged in our communities. 
We have even started to engage students at the elementary schools, but just haven't been able to sustain the development of a full program. We look forward to one day being able to fully engage elementary school students as representation of student voice should come from all levels. I believe all students have the ability to lead if given a chance. This recognition may have my name on it, but it is a reflection of the hard work of our students, school advisors, administrators, our Office of Family and Community Engagement, district leaders, and offices who support this work. In closing, it has truly been an honor to participate in the work of our student with our students, and I appreciate this recognition. And I just want to go ahead and add, um, Ms. Murray is easily the most selfless, um, humble, hardworking, and dedicated person I know, and I'm extremely grateful um, to have had the opportunity to work with her for such a long time. Anyone who knows Miss Murray knows how much she cares, and she never has once ever, I think, um, put herself above students or her job um, in any capacity, and we are just so eternally grateful for everything that she does. Um, so on behalf of all of the students in the Baltimore County Student Leadership Programs um, and in my peers and my colleagues, we thank Ms. Murray tremendously as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Burkle. And give one more round of applause to Ms. Murray and congratulations to you again. And thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Hen. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, and I'll, I'll keep this brief. I just wanted to state that I am so proud of Ms. Murray, and that Ms. Murray has had such an incredible impact on so many student leaders, on so many people that are sitting in, that have sat in this seat before me. She is one of the most amazing individuals I've met um, in BCPS and in my life, and she has inspired me in ways that um, are, are I'm going to be immensely grateful for forever. Um, so thank you so much, Ms. Murray, and I'm so glad that you have have gotten this recognition. I'm, I love you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters. And for that, I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairman McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, terminations, retirements, resignations. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E1 through E3? So moved, So moved, Matt. Offerman. Second, Thomas. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I would further like the board's consent for the contract renewal of the chief auditor. So moved. Second, Thomas. Is there a, okay. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Recused. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Abstain. Ms. Joves? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Recused. Ms. Hen? Abstain. Favor is six. The motion fails. I would like the board's consent for the contract renewal of the assistant chief auditor. Is so, there a motion? So moved, Ms. Jones. Second, Thomas. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Abstain. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. 
Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Abstain. Ms. Hen? Abstain. Favor is seven. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Principal Halthorpe Elementary School and Specialist Equity, Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit F1? So moved, Thomas. Second, Offerman. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? Sure. Our first appointment, Our first appointment. is Yasmin L. Davis from the Program Analyst of Elementary and Secondary Emergency Relief Fund in the Office of the State Superintendent of Education to Equity Specialist, Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. Ms. Davis has br will be bringing the following experience. Two years as a program analyst in the Office of the State Superintendent of Education, also a staff specialist of Title I and project manager. She also served in, this, in the school district of Philadelphia as the program manager for school improvement grant, special assistant to the deputy of the Office of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development, and various jobs such as confidential secretary, office assistant, and administrative technician. She is new to Baltimore County Public Schools, so we welcome Yasmin L. Davis. Acknowledge Yasmin. Our next appointment, do we have our PowerPoint? This is a picture of Yasmin Davis. Let's acknowledge Ms. Davis again at the inspectors. Thank you. And the next appointment is Lisa M. Dudale um, from assistant principal at Hal Thorpe Elementary to principal of Hal Thorpe Elementary. She brings to us 20, over 21 years of service in Baltimore County. Uh, she has served as the assistant principal at Hal Thorpe, assistant principal at Dogwood, and a teacher at Warren Elementary. So congratulations to Lisa M. Dudeo as the new principal, there she is on the screen, the new principal of Halthorpe Elementary School. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and congratulations. Our next item is public comment. And for that, I will turn it over to Vice Chair McMillian. Mr. McMillian? Ms. Hen, I thought that you were covering this. You have the list of speakers, sir. Um, 
I'll introduce if you'd like to introduce the speakers. Yes, please. Uh, yes. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see the time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Mr. McMillian, will you please call our first speaker? Is your microphone on, sir? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, Miss Cheryl Pasteur, she's with the Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Ms. Hen, Mr. McMillian, board members. I am Cheryl Pasteur, and I'm representing the Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators, BCAPSI. As you know, we are a local arm of a national organization comprised of active and retired educators organized to support the work of school systems to ensure that all really does mean all when it comes to the academic, social, and emotional well-being of our students. Tonight, several groups have sent out the clarion call to strengthen our system in those areas. But CAPSI is here tonight to offer a similar voice. We see the academic and behavioral concerns plaguing this system as well as other systems in the state and nation. I have been sent to affirm that BCAPSI, some of whom are members of the groups here tonight, as well as Greek organizations, social and political clubs, churches, and because of their own personal steam and commitment, is open to and ready for a full partnership on on committees to inspire and do the work to make the changes needed. Dr. Zarchin, Dr. McComas, Dr. Yarbrough, Mr. Handy, reach out to us to serve on the Equity Committee to support students in our AP programs, particularly the African American AP pilot, the Woodlawn High School distance learning pilot, the safety management pilot. Call on us to join the NAACP and others to process and activate ways to attract more African American, Latino, and Asian teachers and administrators, people who will be strong role models and practitioners for all students. Call on us in every way to support students with their organizations. There were BCAPSI members on the NAACP's Joint Branch Committee, which supported one of the middle schools with their clubs. We are ready to work with the parent university to offer some continuous supports for parents, for we are our parents and grandparents as well. We are ready with your guidance and transparency to be a part of making equity.
excellence happen. Make no mistake that when all really happens for all, everyone flourishes. We admit that we have not been all we can, should, and need to be. Whether active in the system or retired, our sleeves are rolled up and ready to do the work. Our children, all of them, matter. Reach out and let us know where and how we may assist and partner. This, I am your invite to access our skills, energy, and resolve to be a part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Thank you. Next is Thank Ryan you. Coleman, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Randallstown Chapter. Mr. Coleman. Good evening, good evening. It's weird to be next to Cheryl Pastor in the audience. <laughs> I had to I had to get used to that. <laughs> um, good evening, uh, Chair Hen. Uh, Vice Chair McMillan, Dr. Williams, and the rest of the school board members. Uh, tonight we held a, we, uh, we rallied to urge the school board to focus on the following, e equity, safety school learning environments, and increasing the academic achievement of minority and less affluent white students. I would like to emphasize two important points, equity. The Equity Committee July 2020 report states, and I quote, these data demonstrate persistent systematic inequalities in student outcomes across many measures. The Equity Committee will use these data to identify relevant policies and methods by which these policies may be leveraged to address these inequities. Has the school board focused on strategies of interrupting these predictable patterns of inequality? For example, the magnet programs and African American schools and less affluent white schools are actually a total failure. These magnet school programs do not receive the same resources nor have the same student outcomes as whole school magnets. Number two, academic achievement. The Equity Committee July 2020 report states, and I quote, across all school levels, elementary, middle, and high school, rates of students achieving established benchmarks on academic achievement measures were notably lower for the following student groups, black, Hispanic, students eligible for free and reduced lunch, English learners, students on farms, and special education services. Dr. Darrell Williams stated, and I quote, our academic performance data demonstrates clear trends. Our gaps in performance have been persistent over many years and are primarily based on race. Such an omission from the Baltimore County School Board and the superintendent raises concerns that the Baltimore County Public Schools has received federal funds in violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which declares that no person in the United States shall on the grounds of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation, be denied the benefits be subject to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal funds. I implore the school board to come up with actions and measurable uh, objectives associated with interrupting these predictable patterns of inequality and increasing the student outcomes of minority students. George Washington Carver stated, education in the broadest of truest sense will make an individual seek to help all people, regardless of race, regardless of color, and regardless of condition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Next is Haley Simons, the Baltimore County Public School student. Ms. Simons. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Good evening, Super Superintendent Williams and its team members. My name is Haley Simons. I am 15 years old. I'm the CEO of Halesis Enterprises. I am a sophomore at Chesapeake High School, and I've been advocating for urban youth in and through the sport of triathlon for eight years now. I'm also the, pre the youth president of the NAACP Redness Town Youth Co Council of Baltimore County. 
I am honored to have the opportunity to share concerns as a student and be a voice of the voiceless. Today, I want to talk about equity and fairness for students. I have a disability. My disability stems from my eyes. During my freshman year, I wore glasses during my spring semester. My vision started to worsen, meaning I started to have double vision, my left eye was, imper was imperfectly oval, and it started to affect my grades. While in the midst of all this, I realized I had processing concerns that affected my education and understanding content. At the start of fourth quarter, during the spring semester, I shared concerns to my mother of what was going on, and the process of correcting my vision began while trying to find solutions to acquire assistance from the school, and a 504 was put in, put in place temporarily that would complete the school year. I successfully completed my ninth grade year with the assistance of my 504 put in place. Fast forward one year later, I want to share my reflection with you on how things were as a sophomore. This reflection was at the re request of my AP teacher to all my students, to all of the students. My goal was to be honest and transparent. After my teacher read my reflection, he pulled me out of class. He felt offended of my honesty, honesty and I think he felt offended due to his guilt of being one of the teachers that did not implement my 504 plan. Since the beginning of the school year, each quarter, I have advocated and asked for assistance of my 504 in accommodations in the classroom setting. It fell on deaf ears. In closing, I come to you today advocating for equity of fairness for all students, including myself, I have done all years as a sophomore at Chesapeake High School. However, it is with great hope that advocacy for change does not fall on deaf ears or you collectively turn a blind eye for change as teachers and the educational leadership at my school. As a student, I hope this is not the last time I fight I feel defeated in my educational process since no one was able to assist me. All students deserve better than what we students have been experiencing this academic school year. Thank you. Thank you, young lady. Miss Janie Lee with the PTA Council of Baltimore County. Good evening. You all probably don't even remember who I am anymore. Um, this is my first live meeting or gathering of, with more than eight people in it in two years. Um, my last one was the National PTA Legislative Conference, which ended on March 10th, 2020. And after that, I've been locked in solitude for two years because of some personal issues with health. Um, I came today, it was important to me to introduce you to Leslie Weber, who will be, after my five years now, taking over the reins as president of the PTA Council of Baltimore County, and to tell you that she, I am leaving PTA Council in a way better shape than when I first started, especially under her leadership. Um, PTA has had as hard a time as all the other parents out there over the last two years. We have spent this last year restarting many PTAs that were dormant. And we had to do so at a time where PTA in the state of Maryland had its own issues with the national organization sweeping in and pulling the charter of our state unit. I am happy to report that we now have a new free state PTA. It is fully functional, it is operational, and I am serving as the secretary. Uh, Twenty some years ago when I first started with PTA, I said there would be two positions I would never take. One was president because I'm too opinionated and I don't want to have to preside. And the other was secretary because I'm too opinionated and taking notes it didn't give me the opportunity to speak up, but now I'm fulfilling that as well. PTA is coming back. PTA is strong. And Leslie will lead us on. Um, I will not be here next month, so hopefully Leslie will come and speak on our behalf because my first large group gathering will be next month when we go to Washington and have our legislative conference followed by the 125th anniversary PTA convention. 
National Convention, which will be held at National Harbor. And as an officer of the new Free State PTA Board of Directors, we will play host to the convention. The Free State PTA will be holding its second convention this July, and that will be virtual. So uh, hopefully you can all sign up and attend. It's open to anybody. Um, you don't have to be a member, but we would like for you to join to show your solidarity with our parents. And Leslie will be pushing for advocacy, as we all do, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Because as Ryan said, that's important to all of our children. A child who's not in a healthy and safe environment cannot learn, and that means the health meaning both physical, emotional, and the building. We need safe and healthy buildings that are not falling down and sinking into mud. Leslie? Oh, real quick, real I've got less than 20 seconds. Um, I want to thank Jane for her leadership. She's been amazing, and luckily she's staying on as Vice President for Leadership, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, so we look forward to partnering with BCPS, the Board of Ed, Dr. Williams, um, on safety initiatives, academic achievement, everything, and bringing more PTAs on board. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I've been informed that uh, we're having an issue with the live stream, so we're going to recess the meeting uh, five minutes until we hopefully fix this, and then we'll resume. Five minutes at 7.55 at 8 o'clock.
Can I have your attention, please? We're going to prepare to be resume shortly, very shortly. I regret to inform the public that we were still having technical difficulties or issues with the BCPS TV live stream. As Ms. Hen stated at the outset of our meeting, the public is still able to view the meeting virtually through Microsoft Teams. You can also view the meeting through board docs. We appreciate your patience as staff works to resolve this issue and we remain committed to our viewing public. We'll return to the public comments. Mr. Billy Burke, Council of Administrative and Supervisory Employees case. Mr. Burke, please. Good evening, Chairwoman Mrs. Hen, Vice Chair Mr. McMillian, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you on behalf of the members of CASE. I'd like to speak tonight on two areas of concern. The first is compensation. The 3% mid-year COLA proposed in the county executive's budget falls short of the 4% presented in the budget approved by the board. It effectively works out to be a 1.5% COLA for the entire year. With inflation projected between 6 and 8%, it is likely that case members will take home less pay next year than this year. Case strongly recommends that the board look at using the unspent salary funds created from the staffing shortages to fund an increased COLA for all represented staff. Honestly, I think it's time to rethink the negotiations and budget approval process. I had been involved in the development of the budget for 10 years. This is the first year I've heard the term spending affordability limits. I think there is an opportunity for the CE, the county council, the board, and the superintendent staff to set better parameters in the development of a budget so negotiations are productive. The union spent over five months making tentative agreements with the board only to have them unfunded. The budget proposal and negotiation processes are broken in process and timeline. The second area of concern is using central office staff to cover the staffing shortages in classrooms. Case employees understand the need for safe coverage and are willing to do their part. This solution must be a short-term solution. We can't go into next year with this being the same solution. Staff are essentially working two jobs and getting paid for one, and they are at their breaking points. The design and implementation of the school day must be reimagined to meet the staffing shortage needs. It cannot fall on the backs of teachers, administrators, and central office personnel. Let me illustrate the impact on one position. Let's say I'm a pupil personnel worker or a PPW. On Friday, I was told to cancel all my appointments and substitute in a school. I've never been a teacher and I don't really know how to do that. Or I've never been a secretary and I don't know how to do that. I've rescheduled all my student parents attendance conferences, delaying getting those students back in school with a plan. I contacted the local hospital or mental health facility and rescheduled my student intake meetings, delaying those students getting back into schools with a plan. I had a court appearance scheduled, so I nervously told my supervisor I can't substitute today. I want to put my job on hold to help, but I can't because I love my job and the impact it makes. And so I do two jobs. I could give you the same story for any other central office job being asked to cover. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Cindy Sexton, Teachers Association of Baltimore County. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. At my very first Board of Ed meeting, I have the same message I'm going to give tonight. Properly staffed schools increase academic achievement, reduce discipline concerns, and increase educator retention. My message hasn't changed. 
I hope you heard the speakers outside around safety and discipline concerns. And I know the academic concerns for our students are paramount, as is their mental health and social emotional needs. But we can't fix any of this if we don't have educators in our schools. As you have heard me say many times, we are losing our educators and there are very few waiting in the wings to take their places. I hear from my counterparts in other counties about generous compensation packages, COLAs, and STEPs. And during the budget season, I asked this board to put forth a bold budget, and you did, and I thank you for that. Now this board has the ability to make sure the funds from that budget go to the people. I will again bring up the motion that passed unanimously on February 22nd to prioritize the increase in compensation for employees. This has been an extraordinarily challenging year. There is no question about that. But what do we do now with this budget that will determine if we face these same challenges at the same magnitude next year? We can't fix it all, and some fixes will take time. But compensating our educators now is the one thing we can do that will have an immediate impact on staffing and educator retention. Our students are what we are here for. Let's do right by them and make sure they have the human support and resources they need. Give our educators the compensation they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Bosch Perone, Central Area Educational Advisory Council. Good evening. Good evening to all. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I would like to report to you our latest presentation on May 11th. We had an excellent presentation. I have special thanks to Dr. Uh, Mary McComas and Mr. Jeffrey Holmes for their informative and professional presentation. Also special thanks to my active members who has moderated the session, uh, Leanne Dickens, Elisa Alonso, and Emmanuel Henson. I, as the chair, I have been assigning moderation tasks to my active members, and we are really functioning as a team. In that presentation, I asked our student member, Logan Tai, to prepare students' perspective. So this way, it's not really just presentation by the staff of the school system. And Logan has done very well. He reported the negative effects on COVID, on students' learning. He reported that the transition back into full school has been difficult for many students. And he reported that students should really feel grades are a way to track the growth and development. And when teachers give low grades, he felt that the teachers should be much more supportive. Last but not least, he felt that when coming out of the COVID restrictions and into open school, it was really more about getting the grades and less about learning. And I honestly, personally, I felt the same way, um, you know, uh, in relation to that issue. Um, I knew when I interviewed our student member before selecting him for membership that he has the quality. And I have interviewed every new member for our council and has really worked for us in order to make sure that the new members know the duties that they need. So in that, I invite you for our next presentation, and I really truly invite the public out there. On June 1st, which is a Wednesday, it's going to be an open town hall meeting. We are inviting all the parents, the teachers, the students to come in and to Zoom with us and tell us what's good about the school system, and if there is any critique also to report and we will send you the information because we work for you. Thank you again, and God bless you. Thank you. Ms. Marlena Purcell, the Southwest Area Educational Advisory Council. Good evening. 
Good evening. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair and Vice Chair McMillan, Ms. McMillan, Superintendent Williams, and all on the day as tonight. For the record, my name is Marlena Purcell. I am the chair of the Southwest Area Educational Advisory Council. That includes Arbutus, Lansdowne, Catonsville area, Woodlawn, Windsor Mills, Gwen Oak, um, just to name a few. Tonight, I would like to use my time to show the love verbally to RBCPS faculty and staff. I would like to encourage the board specifically to consider our teachers and our um, ESP um, and their workload and the COLA and the staffing needs. Teachers, how many times have you had to cover a class this month? How many times? I don't know, but I'm sure it's more than I can count. How would, how would it impact your students if you had even less planning time? How would, you, how would your work-life balance suffer if you had more non-professional duties? What meetings did you think was unnecessary and instead could be used to close the learning gap? How many IEP documents did you complete and it took twice as long as needed because you wanted to be detailed as possible? How many recommendations for college, summer camps, and even private schools that you completed as a last minute favor? What reading groups, what math groups got less time due to maybe some discipline issues or a meltdown that a student um, occurred earlier? Which did you choose, lunch or did you choose copying or making a slide deck? How many emails, phone calls, check-ins, behavior charts, text messages, class dojos, Schoology messages did you send home this week and today's only Tuesday? I know they're countless. I'm not going to ask you what items you purchased for my child. I'm going to ask you to save your receipts for your taxes. I would like not to know that your children, your own children, went to bed hungry because I know mine did not because you gave them the lunch and even a snack. My point is, we see you. We know that this job that you do is demanding. And countless, maybe even not, thank, um, many people don't th give you the thanks that you need. You show up each and every day and over and over again. So we thank you for your creativeness, your flexibility, your compassionate, your resource resourcefulness, your selflessness, your patience. This school is winding down, this school year is winding down, and we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your flexibility as the changes occurred due to COVID. Hats off to you for your stamina that you have shown because of your commitment to the students. Still have an opportunity to use this time for academic growth. Thank you for your mindful and skills that keep our schools engaged, students and teacher relationships that you have built, that takes priority and attention and support that has a range. So here's to you. We thank you. You have a month to go. We're just Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Maria Stockton Porter, Educational Support for Professionals of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Maria Stockton Porter a residency investigator who serves as an educational support professional with Baltimore County and also a board director member with the union. And I am speaking this evening on behalf of Jeanette Young, our ESPBC president, and the members. I'm positive you saw us outside of the window tonight and we are educators from a variety of positions asking you to work with us to remedy the staffing crisis that is harming the students, staff, and our communities. As a residency investigator, I support students and families in their endeavors to obtain a quality education with BCPS. I am only one of five in the county who assist students with shared domiciles and confirming residencies for 34 schools, which is comprised of one-fifth or, or approximately over 22,000 of the 111,000 students needing support from just my office every year. 
by the way, the summers are really crazy. I strive always to continue to do my job with integrity and excellence when processing student enrollments, covering staff shortages in the front office and in the classrooms across the county. While I do not mind pitching in because we all are here for the students, the constant staffing shortages is an added stress on an already taxed staff. When we hear employees who have been in the system for 10 or more years that are only worth two cents an hour, it's beyond disheartening. I watched the county executive present his budget, only affording steps in a 3% in January. This means that almost 40% of the ESPBC bargaining unit would receive no increase until January 2023. You say that people are the most important investment in your operating budget. Is that still true? Is that still true? Today, I implore you to show the ESPBC members that we are worth more than 2%. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes the stakeholders groups. We move on to general public comment. Ms. Stephanie Foy. Good evening. Good evening. She's back. You may remember that I'm Stephanie Foy, and I was a BCPS teacher for 31 years, retiring in 2014. I'm also a member of the TABCO Retired Steering Committee. And you will remember that I spoke to you on March 8th about the incorrect insurance amounts being taken from the Maryland State pensions of BCPS retirees due to the November 2020 ransomware attack. A lot has been done in the last two months, and most of it has been poorly executed. A letter was sent to retirees on February 25th saying the problem would be resolved by May 1st. A second letter was sent on March 18th, many of which were improperly addressed. Mine was addressed to my adult daughter, and which had links that it said you could click on to get more information. Newsflash, links on a piece of paper can't be clicked. On April 29th, BCPS 2022 benefits coverage forms with monthly deductions were mailed to retirees to meet the May 1st deadline. Some people even received checks with no explanation for as much as $8,000. The phone started ringing off the hooks here at Greenwood because the majority of the forms were incorrect. Mine has every single premium for my four insurance choices wrong. There were not enough employees to answer the phones, so workers from other departments were called in to help. It was apparent that these people could not answer the retirees' questions, and so a form was developed that we are supposed to complete and return to correct our deductions. I called this morning, and I was told that I would receive my form by email, which I did, and here it is. Others have received recordings to call back at another time. And herein lies the real problem. We cannot provide the correct premium amounts on this form because no document has ever been provided that lists all the rates for the insurances that retirees may purchase. Here is what has been sent to us since October last year, and I challenge you to find the insurance premiums for all the insurances, and don't tell me that they're on the website because not all retirees have the ability to go on the website, not to mention the fact that the ransomware attack occurred in 2020, so we also need a list of premiums for 2021 to calculate what we are owed or what we owe BCPS. We have been asking for this since the first meeting with Dr. Yarborough on February 18th. Where is the list? Why are you asking us to do the work that the employees here should have done correctly in the first place? By filling out these forms. I gave Thank you, Ms. Foy. Thank you. 
Taylor Burrell. Taylor? Boren. I'm sorry. Boren. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Taylor Boren. I am a seventh year art teacher at Logan Elementary. Our school has approximately 479 students in grades K through five, and I teach all of them every week. I want to tell you first about a few of the great things happening in my classroom right now. My first graders are designing their dream playgrounds using cut paper. Students are building their fine motor skills, problem solving as they cut and layer shapes, and using descriptive language to explain the parts of their playgrounds. My second graders are so excited to be using clay. They've observed vessels from different times and places and made comparisons between them. Now they're building their own special vessels and cannot wait to try them out when they're glazed and fired. Finally, I am so proud of my fifth graders for their independence and thoughtfulness as they began a final self-directed project for the year. They wrote proposals, developed a calendar with checkpoints, and last Friday began working on projects ranging from clay self-portraits to imagined landscapes. Getting to know my students and helping them find meaning in their artwork are the reasons I do this job. However, those are silver linings to a job that can otherwise be crushing. COVID cases are up, more and more teachers are out sick, and there are still no subs. Conservatively, I have put in about 300 hours of unpaid labor this year. I arrive at work around 7.30 a.m., about an hour and a half before the bell rings. During that time, I'm usually prepping materials for the day. Last week, I cut 75 pounds of clay into about 100 individual student portions. I made pre-cut shapes and stencils for my foul students and laminated reference photos. And I'm not just at work early. I usually stay after school for a couple hours each week to display my students' artwork in the hallways. Calculated at our hourly rate, my unpaid labor this year alone equates to about $10,000 in lost wages. I am here tonight because the public education system is built on unpaid educator overtime. Overtime that I work because I care about my students and believe deeply in the value of a strong arts education. I take pride in my work, and it's time for BCPS to stop taking advantage of my labor. With educator shortages, sub shortages, higher costs of living, and ripple effects of the pandemic, the moment is now. I need BCPS to rise to the occasion. I need you to fund my COLA in July, not January. I need the value of my work to be reflected in my pay. Thank you. Dr. Bosch Perone. Good evening again. Good evening, I'm back, I guess. We always start with Pledge of Allegiance, with liberty and justice for all. I love those special words. They attracted me to leave everything behind and be who I am today, perhaps bothering you every two weeks speaking to you. All men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. What beautiful words they are. But look around us. We have so much violence in the school, around the school, out in the public. I don't think that really matches those beautiful words I mentioned to you. Words must mean something. They must be implemented. They should mean what they mean. The question is, what does the education system is doing about that? To me, the question is, does administration has fair representation of the mosaic of Baltimore County? I really don't think so. Does the board represent the variety of people in Baltimore County? To a good degree, 
but there is improvement. Are there enough counselors in the school system to pick up mental issues, support, etc.? I don't think so. Is the school system is able to pick up hateful tendencies and implement intervention before? I really don't think so. I know teaching hate or love starts at home. But I think the school system can do something good about it. We can't let it go. The school system can teach ethics, values. Do we have an ethics program in elementary school teaching kids right from wrong, middle school, high school? I don't think so. I have been sitting here 25 years. I never really saw that. Do we follow our students and see whether they became good citizens or bad citizens? Or we just stick to grades like my student member of the central area said. GM follows their automobile production to the end. Boeing does the same thing. When we graduate people, we don't really follow them Thank you. Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening. And congratulations on demonstrating responsiveness and flexibility, uh, which you can only do if something goes wrong during your observation. I thought I was in March 2021 with hybrid teaching. So good evening. Thank you, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. My name is Lloyd Allen, and I'm a 23-year veteran teacher in Baltimore County Public Schools. Tonight, my topic is applications of growth mindset. My first year teaching, I didn't know what I didn't know. My second year teaching, I knew what I was doing wrong, but I couldn't figure out how to fix it. Every lesson I saw and felt pedagogical mistakes, but even when I saw the mistakes coming, I could not fix them in time. I think it was around my third year teaching that I started to teach fluently. During that second year teaching, the year that I started to recognize my pedagogical mistakes, my first observation lesson was on systems of equations. Kevin and Sharon observed my lesson carefully aligned to the course indicators and the county timeline. The problem was my students couldn't yet solve single equations. So systems of equations with two equations were out of their grasp. Kevin told me, Lloyd, you were a train on the tracks and your students were still at the station. The awful thing is I knew that during the lesson. I had given my students a warm up that carefully measured that they did not have the prerequisite skills. I knew that I should collect formative assessment data about what my students knew, but I did not have the chops to actually use that data to guide my instruction. After having a thorough verbal debrief on the lesson, Kevin taught me a golf term. He gave me a mulligan on the lesson, allowing me to take this verbal feedback, internalize it, and try again without recording it on the scorecard. Since that lesson in October of 2000, I have continued to strive to keep my students on the train and not to leave them at the station. If my students aren't learning, then I am not a teacher. I internalized the feedback and my second shot at the lesson was satisfactory, the best that we could get at that time. Kevin was modeling the growth mindset before it was cool. And moreover, he was applying it to teacher evaluation. This was 13 years before Marzano and Toth wrote teacher evaluation that makes a difference. He didn't form a fixed mindset opinion that I must be a bad teacher just because he had witnessed a bad lesson. He didn't target me for dismissal. He essentially said that I needed more cooking. He gave me feedback and asked me to grow. When I hear about teachers being targeted and then dismissed, it makes me wonder the extent to which our system is modeling a growth mindset. We need to properly support and then retain our brand new teachers. New teachers need a lot of support, content and community, pedagogy and practical matters. I'm asking you to ensure that those supports are in place. We also need to ensure that the salary scale financially attracts novice teachers to our system over other districts, and that the salary scale keeps all of us here. A budget is a moral document. It demonstrates the extent to which you value and prioritize us. I'll now model a growth mindset by expecting an up- Thank you. 
Dr. Takima Dorsey. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Williams and esteemed board members. My name is Dr. Takima Dorsey. I'm a 30-year educator, had the opportunity to work in Harford County as also well as a consultant. I've worked K-12, higher ed, even, doc even with doctoral learners to help them to become doctoral holders. I come here today to share feedback that I hope that will not fall on deaf ear and you will not turn a blind eye to. If we're familiar with Cooley High, that was a very popular movie back in the 80s and the 90s. So Dr. Williams, I would like to start with you. I would love for you to get jiggy with it in your last term. And what do I mean by that, Dr. Williams? I mean, we're looking for, there are a lot of things that we've heard outside today, as well as internal. In your last year, in your last year of your term, even if you are to be re reappointed or reelected, I'm gonna ask you to get your hands dirty a little bit. And what do I mean by that? I'm asking you to take on the tough topics that p put the politics aside and really to understand what's happening on the front line and not just on higher ed level. I want you to, willing, want you to be willing more to go to bat for the voiceless, not for the vo people who actually have the voice hold educational leadership more accountable than they're being held today. I'm asking you to develop a stronger relationship with the frontline workers, not the people that work for you, but for those you work for, which are the youth. We're asking you to go back for the Office of Constituent Engagement and help to allow community partnerships to actually partner with schools and not to run into red tape when they're working with educational leaders inside the school to bring solutions to help close the disparity gaps. It's a tough road, Dr. Williams. And we're and businesses are being stopped at the front door while educational leaders are screaming for help. Now I turn to the board. I had the opportunity to read the article in a newspaper, and I will, be, I will be honest, it was disheartening. It was hard and disheartening to read the dirty laundry aired to the public because I lost faith as a constituent, as a coach, and as a parent. Strife, disrespect, tired, fi fired up, overwhelmed, sick and tired, enough is, is enough. As a parent, I'm going through the same thing, but every day I get up and fight. While you still hold the position of board members, I'm going to ask you to unite because at the end of the day, you and Dr. Williams are the ones that we have to turn to for positive change. And if we can't have faith in you holding that position, then our educational system is in trouble. You have the opportunity and the power to come together to close the gap, to reach back not through just school policy, but things with the people and the community. Thank you. The community, so I'm just asking you, do the right thing in the time that you have, whether you like what you're doing. Please. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Beverly Folkoff. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Beverly Fokoff. I am a self-contained special education teacher at Relay Elementary School. And I have been a special ed teacher in this county for about 15 years. Um, but I have been in public education my entire life. My father was a professor at Salisbury University and I used to help him grade scantrons on our dining room table. My mother ran the Project Read program through her, um, through our local library, and I used to do workbooks alongside the people she was tutoring. And my grandmother uh, originally taught shorthand before becoming dean of women at one of the bigger high schools in Queens, New York. I have lived in education my entire life. 
Last week, I was helping one of my fellow special educators, uh, Courtney, unjam the copy machine. We were both elbow deep in the bowels of the thing, just catching up in each other's lives while we ripped out small pieces of paper. And uh, Courtney told me that her daughter was a junior and starting to look at colleges. She told me about the school she was interested in, and I asked what subjects her daughter wanted to study. And she stopped, and she looked me dead in the eye and said, don't worry, she's not going into education. And I sighed in relief. Me, who has lived my entire life in education. Me, who has had many student interns, many of whom were amazing teachers in this county right now. Me. And I was happy to hear someone saying that they were staying away from this profession. This board has the ability right now to choose the future of education and of teachers like me and like Courtney. You have the ability to make Baltimore County a place where teachers fight to get into instead of fighting to get out of. You have the ability to create environments where teachers will thrive instead of wilting away. You have the ability to be a place people will miss when they're gone instead of a place people are glad to get away from. And the power you have is with through your purse strings. Pay us what we deserve. Complete the work that so many educators did through the negotiations process. Provide us with an actual cost of living increase and the compressed salary scale. You have the power to turn Baltimore County schools into a place I'd be proud to tell anyone, young and old, to work. Do the right thing. Make education in this county a place to be proud of. Fund our educators fairly. Thank you. Thank you. Mohammed Jamil. Good evening. Good evening. Peace and blessings to all. Thank you. Prescribed orderly conduct or pattern of behavior known as discipline of our students has been brought up many times. The dysfunctional family units, normalizing of any speech as freedom of speech, lack of communication, lack of leadership, lack of motivation, bad habits, unequal enforcement of the law, and student-teacher relationships are just a few well-known causes of indiscipline, as stated by sociologists. Students and our leaders are product of our environment and the society. We as a nation are leading in the world in the murder rates, sexual assault, domestic abuse, bullying, use of the gun, etc. Over 32,000 were killed using guns every year. As of yesterday, there have been 200 mass shootings just in the last 136 days. We have the largest incarcerated population per capita in the world. We seem to be unable to resolve our disputes and differences peacefully and without anger. Memorial Day is about two weeks away. It is a somber day, remembering the soldiers killed in all our wars. We have been at war for 228 years, since 246 years of our country's inception. Not to mention the Indian wars prior to revolutionary wars. Nearly 1.5 million soldiers who were fathers, sons, brothers, and husbands were killed in these wars. These wars also resulted in quarter billion civilians killed worldwide, not to mention millions and millions of those who were wounded, some permanently. Many Muslim soldiers have been a part of our military and fought and killed in every war, including Revolutionary War. The signia with a crescent was requested only in 1993. President Obama was the first president to recognize the sacrifices of the Muslim soldiers. Our leaders are also the product of our society. We observe the Memorial Day year after year with cookouts, etc. But we need to contemplate the reasons and gravity of the actions and memorialize those killed. Only 11 of the 29 wars were declared wars. 
I thank the BCPS to have introduced STEM and anti-bullying programs as the need arose. Introduction of courses in anger management and conflict resolution programs are much needed now. This will give the tools to the citizens, the leaders of tomorrow, in reducing the violence and the discipline problems to create a peaceful society. I know that you've been adding courses and many requests are being made, but you have to prioritize to stop the violence and have peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Erica Ma. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Williams and staff. My name is Erica Ma, and I'm a parent and teacher in BCPS. And there are so many issues that need to be addressed, and I'll see what I can do in three minutes. <laughs> teacher appreciation was two weeks ago. And while there are certainly moments, especially at our own schools, where we felt appreciated, the feeling was not long-lasting. The difficulties of workload, understaffing, and behaviors continue to rear their heads. One thing that would make us feel appreciated beyond that one week would be to, pay, to be paid as professionals who are valued for their work, all of our work. If the school year starts this summer, then our COLO should start this summer. Waiting to have it in January makes a statement that we are only appreciated half of the time. And our missing step. I have a coworker who will have worked 30 years next year and will get paid as her 29th year. How is that appreciating her three decades of service? And how can I not mention ESPBCs? They are the hidden gems of our schools, and teachers cannot give effective instruction without them. They need more pay and benefits. And it's not just the actual pay amount. It's the message that you are sending to the future and nearby teachers and staff. We have a staff shortage in all areas, and, the pe and people have many options in our horseshoe-shaped county. Why would they come to a county that won't acknowledge our full worth in a timely fashion? Frankly, they won't. And the staff shortages will continue in our classroom, in our small groups, on the buses. We will not have enough teachers, age, or drivers again. And buses. The serious inequities that the bus issues are highlighting. Nearly every day, Lansdowne Elementary has three to four late buses, and sometimes buses that don't even show up. I'm assuming you all think that a 100 to 1 ratio is not safe. So teachers help stay to help administrators well beyond their contract hours. And our system has agreed to pay those teachers, which is how it should be. However, this pay is coming directly from school budgets, our children's budgets. So our school regularly has to pay for teacher overtime for late bus systems. And our neighboring school, which has no buses, has no effect on their budget. I don't know how BCPS defines equity, but one school having major impacts to their school budget and staff time, while another has absolutely none, is not what I call equity. There's absolutely nothing our school can do about late buses. So why is our school budget, our students' budget, and our staff time being severely impacted by late buses? If we are not paying these drivers because we have not hired them, why are we paying from our children's budget and not the transportation budget? It's not just an equitable, it makes absolutely no logical sense. COVID, I hate, hate, hate to bring this up, but rates are skyrocketing. I hated virtual learning and teaching, and I don't want to go back to that. But we need to at least reconsider masking and talk about how to keep everyone safe and healthy. Fortunately, my time's up, but not the concerns of our teachers, parents, and community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sharon Seroff. course, my computer has a mind of its own when I get up here. Good evening. Good evening. How many of you are aware that 504 plans and IEPs are legal documents? How many of you know the difference between a 504 plan and an IEP? Both 504 plans and IEPs are for individuals who have some kind of disability that impacts them in the classroom. The difference is that students with IEPs need specialized instruction. 
So if 504 plans and IEPs are legal documents, why is it so difficult to implement them? I think we heard from a student earlier who's not getting hers implemented. If they're legal documents, that means that they are to be followed as written. If a 504 says a child needs a physical book, you provide them with the physical book. You don't tell the parent and the child, I am going to give you access online. Give them the physical book. There's a difference between giving them access and giving them the actual item. IEP chairs and, and special education staff need to realize that students have 504 plans because they have a disability and they need to be followed. The accommodations on that plan are essential for the student to be to able to access the curriculum and be successful. Those of us who are cra have crafted IEPs and 504s are also aware of something called a fully loaded 504. If you can't find room on the document to put accommodations, I think you'd better start thinking that that child needs assessments because the disability is impacting them in the classroom. If I'm a parent and I raise that issue to you, there's something going on and you need to recognize it. We heard from a student earlier this evening as to how she is being affected by her 504 plan not being implemented. That statement should open our eyes to what is going on in our school buildings. Thank you. That concludes the general public comment section. We move on to policy 8230, which is internal board policies, duties and responsibilities, dash board member orientation. Dr. Bosch Perone. Nobody wants to listen to me. Good evening. I am not really talking about any board member. It's a pure looking at the policy. It's a good improvement. However, I have few thoughts. Line number seven to nine, talking about the new member to be knowledgeable about school board governors and operations in so far as possible. I think in so far as possible is vague, at least to me as a immigrant. I think something as much as possible would be better. Next one on line 13, the candidate for the board office. It's important that the candidate for the board office understands the responsibilities. How do we measure that understanding? I mean, sometimes patients kind of say, yeah, I understand, but they didn't. Next one is basically about the orientation, the teaching, the difference between administration and governance, the teaching of Robert's rules, the teachings of budget, all of them are really important, all right? However, my thought to you, as I read the policy, that these are after the fact that the person has been selected. And to me, they need to be done before. You need to make sure the person basically is knowledgeable before they are chosen. Next one is the policy does not address how much money the board member gets paid. I think what you get paid is really too little. 
for the amount of effort and time you spend in. That's why I am a full-time physician. I love to be a board member. I can't. I have to either retire or maybe work two days a week. I think board members deserve to have a much better pay. The policy doesn't really address the negatives. I think the policy needs to make sure that the members that are selected are picked up if they don't have special agenda and if they don't have a cozy relationship with companies or administration, because that would be obviously a conflict of interest. And they don't have argumentative personalities, you know, arguing time and time and over and over again. Or using policies for the wrong reasons. I don't see it as much here, but I see it more on Annapolis and Washington, but I really think that would apply. And it doesn't really address Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Han, letter H. Yes, thank you, Mr. McMillian. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Mercedes. Good evening, Ms. Han. Nothing to report from closed session. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. This is the first reader. And for that, I call on Ms. Lily Rowe, chair of the policy review committee. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend board policy 8230, internal board policies, duties and responsibilities, board member orientation. This policy is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit I. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the board's Policy Review Committee for board policy 8230? So moved, Mac. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Mr. Thomas, did you have a comment? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. yes. Um, I move to, move to insert to presenting each new board member with the budget. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I move to insert. Thank you, sorry. I move to insert presenting each new board member with a budget training with a focus on the cap operating and capital budget process to line 21 of page two. Is there a second? Second, Hager. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Would you like to speak to your motion, Mr. Thomas? Yes, I would love to. So House Bill 192, which was originally introduced by Delegate Ebersol to increase the student member of the board's voting rights to include the capital and the operating budget, passed in both the House and Senate. One of the provisions of that bill was that initially the student member would be required to have a training before they could vote on the budget. But it has was since expanded um, on the Senate floor to include every board member in the Board of Education. Uh, this bill hasn't been signed by Governor Hogan yet, um, or it, I'm not sure if it will be signed, but it was passed in both the House and the Senate, so I believe that we should codify the provisions of that bill um, in our board policy, uh, just to make sure that we are following the law. That's my only comment. And even if the bill isn't signed by the governor or is vetoed, I still think this is an important part of our, our us being board members and being able to participate in the budget process. The policy already does describe giving board members materials related to the operating capital budgets, but it doesn't specifically say a training. And I think that is important. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question um, for Ms. Rowe as chair in response um, to your motion, Mr. Thomas. Um, Ms. Rowe, would this be the appropriate policy in your opinion um, to add this language to or are you aware of any other policies that we should consider this type of addition? So typically what happens when there's law changes is that the law office reviews the changes to the law and makes recommendations to the PRC committee about um, how to have those policies comply with law. So we could add this to the policy now, but in any case, the law office will review the policies to make sure they're compliant with law. Thank you, and that just answered my second question. Um, 
which is the, the process. And it's my understanding that that review consists of reviewing all of our policies to determine where the legal change um, may need to be made. Is that your understanding? That's correct. That usually comes from the law office. Okay. So, um, Mr. Thomas, that, that said, I it would be my preference to follow the, the pr procedure when that does become law. Um, so I, while I support the spirit of your motion, I, because it deviates from the established um, process of the law office and the policy review committee, I would not support circumventing that um, only for that reason. Um, are there any other questions or comments? I see Dr. Hager has a comment in the chat. Dr. Hager? Um, I just wanted to say that I do support this because um, it, it can't hurt, and it's certainly something that I, I joined the board after everyone else had been on the board for a few years, and I relied heavily on my fellow board members t for guidance during the budget process, just how to approach the budget and things like that, and I think having a, a training during orientation that everyone comes on with the same training would be really useful, whether the law passes or not. So I, I do support this addition. Okay. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. As I read it, um, well, first of all, I, I would support this, but I, as I read it, it didn't look like it was just applying to a student member. It would be any, any new board member. So whether or not the law passes, I think that this would be important, and I, I think it's, it's simplistic, it's straightforward, and it's, frankly, it's necessary. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And for clarification, the law as um, modified also applies to all members of the board now. Um, Mrs. Thank you. Pelosi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Thomas, for bringing this up um, to um, provide an opportunity for discussion. Um, there is a paragraph, um, line 29, paragraph C, all new members are strongly encouraged to attend workshops for new board members conducted by the Maryland Association of Boards of Education and the National School Board Association. Um, so in my experience over six years on the board, the MABE trainings have been um, really very helpful, very on target. Um, they have a full-time staff. Uh, that works year-round to stay current with the laws, uh, best practices around the state, um, and <clears throat> provide professional development. So I would actually um, encourage strengthening the training provided to the board by MABE. Uh, there are programs that they have where they will bring the MABE trainers to the board, um, and especially now with remote trainings available, um, it would be uh, much more... Um, convenient and flexible in order to do that. So um, I definitely believe more training is important, and um, but I do think that additional things um, should be considered to strengthen bringing that training, making it more accessible to, as Dr. Hager said, the full board so that the whole board is operating with the same information. Um, so I'll support your motion because the more training, the better anywhere and everywhere. Uh, but I would also suggest this is first reader, so that perhaps at second reader, uh, we could also consider something about strengthening the accessibility to MABE's professional development. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. And I see that um, Ms. Joes has a comment, and then I would like to make a follow-up comment to Mrs. Causey. So, Ms. Joes. Thank you. I support this uh, amendment by the student member. I think it's important, uh, regardless of whether people have been on the f board four years, six years, 10 years, I have seen a lot of adult board members not knowing the basics of uh, a school construction fund, debt service, food service, uh, operating budget. And it's important that that's one of the core activities the board does to understand that. I. I fully support it because just asking people to attend a training is not always going to happen. Case in point, the current, the past NSBA, only less than five members of the board attended that uh, conference. So I think it's important that we push for that. Thank you. <laughs> five, yes. Thank you. Um, 
I too agree that that budget training is extremely important. Again, my concerns are more procedural than the necessity for this. And to Mrs. Causey's point, um, MABE is an outstanding resource. However, the law specifically states that um, BCPS staff develop the budget yeah. training. Um, they are the subject matter experts. I would also argue that um, the county county government should play a role as our funding partners, and perhaps even um, the state may eventually play a role. But for now, um, our policy needs to be consistent with um, that bill should it become law. So again, my concerns are more procedural in that if we are going to make amendments to our policy, they need to be consistent with the law when signed. And Ms. Howie and her team do an outstanding job at that and making sure that we dot our I's and cross our T's. So again, my concerns are not with the necessity of this, but rather that we don't circumvent the process and put language in policy that may need to change once the law is in place. So while this language seems benign enough, and I de definitely support it, I would not want to have to um, revisit it and correct anything um, once that becomes law. So I, I just think we're putting the cart before the horse. Um, and I see that there are other questions. Um, okay, so Mr. Thomas, you've indicated. Okay, thank you. You provided the, the language from House Bill 192. Um, for board members. And Ms. Mack, you had a question. To your point, Ms. Hen, if we included this, and I do support it, um, would we be limited? Could not could we th then bring the policy forward if the whatever gets approved differs from what we've added now, or do we have to wait a certain number of years? Thank you, Ms. Mack. I think um, the Policy Review Committee can bring forth um, any policy they deem necessary at any time. Certainly um, a legal change would necessitate bringing a policy forward for review. Um, given the workload of that committee right now, as, as Ms. Rowe can attest, um, I would be hesitant to, to recommend more or duplicate efforts on the committee's plate. However, to answer your question, um, this approving this change would not preclude the committee from bringing the policy back and correcting any language or adding any language to it to make it consistent with the law. We would do so anyway when that went into effect. Thank you. Ms. Thank you. Sure. Given that this law is going to become law soon, and, and I, I hesitate to say this because Ms. Howie's not here. She isn't, is she? No. We could send this we could send this back to committee and bring it back to the full board once the law office has reviewed it and, and aligned some of it with the law because we could add those two war words, but there's also legal references and things that need to be, oh, Ms. Howie is here. Can Ms. Howie answer the question? If, if we make the changes for this, um, this, amend, this um, amendment to the policy, is that the only thing that would be needed to align it with the law? Or is it going to have to go back to PRC anyway for legal references, notations, analysis, and all of that? And if we have to do that in the next few months anyway, shouldn't we maybe send it back to PRC? Thank if Ms. You. Howie has an opinion on that, I would love to hear that. Sure. Ms. Howie, is that something you could comment on, please? Good evening, board members. Good evening. Um, if you wish to have this language, uh, Mr. Thomas's language included, the language is not necessarily, uh, does not necessarily track uh, the language in what was House Bill 192. So the question is whether or not, number one, you consider this to be orientation, because as I read the House bill, it's not simply orientation, it is training period for um, all members of the board concerning the budgetary process. So while you may want to expand the orientation uh, policy, uh, it does not appear that the language that has been recommended necessarily addresses the statute. 
Thank you. And, and Ms. Howie, and feel free to jump in, Ms. Rowe, um, if I'm understanding for board members that have already re received orientation, this would not, this language would not necessarily address those needs in terms of receiving the training. That is correct. I it's understand, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. That's the way I understand it. That Mr. Thomas has recommended that there be uh, certain training, but that's not the way I read the language that is in the the statute or now the House bill, not yet the statute. Thank you. Ms. Rowe, did you have any other questions or comments? So, Ms. Howie, is that then we're just voting here on Mr. Thomas's language, then we're still going to have to review the statute, is that correct? That would be my advice, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Yes, Dr. Hager. So if that's the case, then it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that this um, new language would go into a different policy about board trainings because this one's specifically about orientation for new board members, which to me sounds like a great time to get training on the budget. So um, to me, I feel like we could do both. So I don't know, I would advocate for, um, for adapting the language that Mr. Thomas proposed and maybe also adding language to another uh, policy on training. I feel like it, it can't hurt to have it in both places. And, and yes, and I, I think we're all getting to the same place here in this discussion, um, which may support Ms. Rowe's suggestion of sending this back to committee um, and asking um, Ms. Howie and team to review for the policies that um, this would affect which is part of the process when this would go into effect. And I think that is imminent. So it would, it's probably gonna be coming to committee at the same time that we're, um, we may recommend it be sent back to committee and then have all of the policies that need to be updated, updated at once so that they're consistent and that we're not just updating the orientation, but as you said, a training policy to incorporate the requirement of budget training in that policy as well. Um, Ms. Rowe, you had a question. Yes, Ms. Howie, if this policy gets sent back to policy and review to um, wait for the review of that statute, is there any legal timeline would be out of compliance with? Like was this, was this policy that's before us now a result of a legal requirement or so do we need to pass this one now and then come back to it again? Um, so uh, you would still be able to comply with the statute without having a policy. As I read the bill, now the enrolled bill, there was no requirement that the mandated training be part of board policy. So the board training that staff is required to create, staff will create whether or not you have a policy. Okay, so we don't really need to return this to PRC then? Not unless you want this policy to include the requirement that is in the involved legislation. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I have a follow-up to that then. Um, Ms. Howie, would you advise adding this to policy prior to the training being developed by staff? And how would that affect board members' compliance with policy if said training does not yet exist? It is true the training does not yet exist and there's an argument to be made that this policies training is not the same training that has to be provided under the statute unless that is the board's desire. Understood. So, in, but in the absence of any training um, to meet the requirement of this proposed amendment, um, or in the absence of that training, board members could not be in compliance with this. In the absence of any training, you would not be but you would training. not be compliant with the soon to be statute and the statutory requirement. Uh, so Ooh. the the statute having the policy is not required by the statute. Having the training is required by the statute. Correct. The I, I, whether or not you want to have the statutory mandate in policy. And I, what I'm asking is, say we fill our vacant seat 
tomorrow in the absence of a budget training to be provided to that new member mm -hmm. during orientation, we would be out of compliance with our policy since that training does not yet exist. Any training for, for budget matters, whether it be the stat, the <coughs> training so prior by stat or not. I would not go that far, ma'am. It seems to me that if there is a member appointed tomorrow and in the absence of a policy mandate, staff in finance is well able to provide a training to that new staff person or to that new board member. The question is whether or not that training would be compliant with the yet to be uh, signed statute. I don't think the two are necessarily equivalent. Mrs. Causey. Thank you. I appreciate the discussion. Um, again, I'm going to support this amendment. This is first reader. So if there's additional issues um, that come up, they could be addressed at second reader. Um, and also, <clears throat> um, having this policy strengthened the way that it is would be better than not having it's strengthened at this point, no matter what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments, board members, before we call the vote? Okay. Mr. Thomas, would you restate your motion, please? Sure. I move to insert presenting each new board member with a budget training with a focus on the operating and capital budget process to line 21 of page two on policy, uh, the policy that we are reviewing right now. The 8230. That is correct. Thank you. Ms. Gilbert, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. So the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So may I have a motion to accept um, the recommendation of the board's policy review committee for board policy 8230 as amended. I think you already, oh, so moved, Thomas. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mercedes, is a second needed since the policy has been amended? I would say yes. Okay, may I have a second? Second, Scott. Thank you, any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies. And for that, I call on the Policy Review Committee Chair, Ms. Rowe. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend board policy 5580, bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation. This recommendation is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit J. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's Policy Review Committee? So moved, Thomas. So moved, second. Thomas, sorry. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the Education Foundation of Baltimore County Public Schools. And for that, I call on Ms. Charlie Green, Ms. Phelps, and Ms. Lemon. Let me check. 
Pardon me. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. BCPS is grateful for the work of the Education Foundation, what it does to build and provide resources to serve students, educators, and schools. Our critical partnership helps meet the needs of more than 11, um, 111,000 students and prepare them for success now and in the future. At this time, I would like to introduce, which requires no introduction, Ms. Debbie Phelps, Education Foundation Executive Director, who will provide an update on the foundation's work. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me this evening, Madam Chair and distinguished board members, Dr. Williams and Executive Cabinet, and those in the gallery. My name is Deborah Phelps. I'm the Executive Director, the first Executive Director of the Education Foundation in of Baltimore County Public Schools, appointed in 2012. We believe in, in the foundation that we contribute to a brighter future for our children. We believe that collaboration enhances relationships, collaboration among and within the foundation, the district, and the community. When you take a look at our historical perspective, when I came in, the Education Foundation was called the Baltimore County Education Foundation. And the first thing my board wanted to do was to change the title. I'm like, okay, so we are the Education Foundation of Baltimore County Public Schools, founded in October 25th, 1992. And this is our 30th anniversary. So we're very excited as a 501c3 in support of equality education for all students in Baltimore County. When you take a look at uh, the past years that we've been here together, we've had continuous growth and measurable success for equitable distribution of and opportunities and experiences for a brighter and successful future for our students, educators, and our schools. Statement of purpose, why? Why are we here? Well, it's very easy. Students, teachers, and schools. So when you take a look at our 111,000 plus students, nearly 7,900 educators and 177 schools, programs, and centers, we want to provide resources to serve each and every one of them. We also want to provide under federal and state laws an, an appropriate method to be able to solicit charitable contributions. Our mission, vision, and goals are very simple. We want to support improved educational outcomes for our community through three goals fundraising, programs, and advocacy. When you take a look at our vision, it is that brighter future for all of our children, our educators, and our schools, and have, make sure that they have the resources needed for success. So let's take a walk and look, take a look at our goals. First of all, our fundraising goal. Number one, we want to make sure that we are establishing partnerships, partnerships that we maintain and sustain, partnerships that believe in public education in Baltimore County, our students, our educators, and our schoolhouses, because we want to increase revenue to be able to support all of those three. When you take a look at our events, we have two major events a year. One, we went back to the links and we had our golf course, our, excuse me, our tee off for Team BCPS Golf Classic in October of this year. It was a great time to be back together to be able to build camaraderie and to be able to reestablish partnerships face to face that we hadn't seen for several years. Our State of the Schools is our signature event that we usually host, but on March 13th, when the schoolhouse doors closed, we had to cancel and later postpone, then cancel our State of the Schools. We had a board member who came to us and said, we need another way to increase our revenue. How about doing a softball game? Okay, let's have a softball game. And so he proposed this program to be able to be a grassroots event where teachers and educators were going to pick up their gloves, wipe off their cleats, put on them, and go out and play a competitive but a fun game of softball. Well, this grew. 
And if any of you were there last week on May, May 14th, you will find that beginning at 12 o'clock, we had a skills camp with our allied sports students. It was a middle school san sanctioned event that we had 100 students on the football field to be able to go through skills with League of Dreams. It was very rewarding from opening ceremonies to closing ceremonies with two of our pre medal pre presenters right here in this room, one being Dr. Williams and the other being Christian. So we're very happy to be able to host that first part of Let's Play Ball. We then moved to the softball diamond where we had teachers and administrators play a game of softball. Competitive, yes. Lighthearted, yes. But boy, did each one of them want to win that game. So when we take a look at our team BCPS administrators versus educators, we had nearly 60 administrators and educators who signed up. They were coached by two all-star legendary coaches, Al Bumbry and Mike Bordick, and they had a ball playing softball. And guess who won? It might have been the administrators. But even though that was going on, along in Vendor Village, we had 20 vendors um, in our Vendor Village. We had five food trucks. We had nearly 50 sponsors or partners that partnered with us, raising nearly $70,000 for a simple game of baseball that ended up to be a day filled with memories, camaraderie, and everybody laughed and had a good time. Our second goal being that of programs. We want to make sure that we are funding what is necessary in our school district. So the first is our grants. Our grants are 21st century themed, and the first grant by the foundation was given in 2010 and that was from their investment earnings two years before I came on board, and it was $10,000 in grant money. If you take a look at your notes, you will see that from 2010 to 2022, we have awarded to schools and offices 386 grants, totaling over $604,000. Now, you may say, what are these grants all about and what are they for? They're able to create innovative programs and initiatives within the schoolhouse that align with the school's progress plan. The 21st Century Grants, anywhere from health literacy, civic awareness, STEM, arts and crafts, excuse me, arts, art literacy, you will find that they are one to be able to say an amazing opportunity for our, our schools. We also have partnerships, as we talked about enhancing partnerships. We have had partnership with the Baltimore County government since 2013, where we have Team BCPS Clean Green 15 grants. This is a, com a competitive grant where stu schools actually compete against each other to be able to have money to be able to impact environmental literacy on their campus. This past year, we've also had partnership with FFFCU to be able to have teachers apply for $500 grants to be able to get resources for their classroom for a project, or maybe a team of teachers for something that they're doing together. As we move through this fiscal year, we had an extra $10,000 in funding as we took a look at our, our treasury, and we were able to put fast funds into place where teachers were able to apply over these past two months grants totaling $1,000 a piece. So those are our grant programs that we have and one part of the programs. Our second program that you take a look at are scholarships. We want to make sure that we impact our students who are going to two and four year colleges and universities, as well as trade and technical schools. Our scholarship program is funded by our fundraising efforts, as well as private philanthropic donors. Again, let me emphasize the word partnerships with people who want to support our students in Baltimore County. From 2004 to 2021, we have awarded 307 scholarships to the foundation, totaling nearly $600,000 in scholarship dollars for our students. As we come into awards um, ceremonies coming up with our district and graduation, we're going to add another $25,000 in scholarships this year. So we are very happy to report that too as well. The last area in the, in the area of programs and goal number two talks about our special initiatives. This is when I am meeting with partners who say, hey, I want to help a certain school in the central or the east or the west zone. I have $5,000 for a project. Is there a school you can partner me with? So these are our special initiatives that we have. And as you see, we have 33 active special initiative schools and, and offices that we have these programs with. 
These are things such as BCPS Film Fest that came, comes through the foundation, Teacher of the Year, um, Back to School Involves You, the Westie Walk at, at, at the new, new, at new West House and Elementary School, as well as Black History Month writing contest that was held this year. These are ongoing projects that we built and we fund year after year to be able to support the district and different initiatives within the school. Those three things are what most education foundations support in any LEA across the state and around the nation. This program that I'm going to share with you now is my baby. I always say it's the fifth child I never had, but it supports teachers and it supports students. It builds team, it builds collegiality, and it makes sure that we are having teachers not reach into their pockets to be able to fund resources or projects in their, in their schoolhouse. This is called the Exchangery, gizmos and gadgets galore. The Exchangery is actually brick and mortar. There are two collaborative educator resource centers that we have in Baltimore County. We are the only LEA in this state that has not only one, but two of these teacher centers. It, this evolved out of a simple back to school drive, let's collect some school supply drives and let's distribute them to the teachers. When you take a look at the exchange, let me give you some numbers first. The first one opened in 2018. So from 2018 to February of 2022, we have serviced over 9,000 teachers with our exchangeries. When you take a look at a ratio of 1 to 26, we have serviced over 352,000 students with supplies and resources for them to be academically successful. When you take a look at books, with our Books for Ben campaign, we have distributed over 36,000 books with 3,000 that went out last week at Let's Play Ball. Our goal is 50,000 50, before the end of June to impact literacy. And then total monetary value that we have put back in the school, nearly $1.2 million worth of resources. Now, will you walk with me as we take a look at these schematics? As you take a look at your notes, the first schematic for our exchangery was at Windsor Mill in partnership with Mr. Scott Dorsey Merrick Companies. This is a 2,700 square foot center that is stocked to the gills with supplies for our students. Again, through another partnership with American Design, it's staged with 21st century classroom furniture. You may say, what kind of campaigns do we have in our exchangeries? First of all, tools for schools. We want to make sure that we have supplies and resources in our students' hands and our teachers' classrooms to impact their academics, their therapeutic, and their social-emotional well-being. We also want to make sure that we are wrapping warmth around our students by having Share the Warmth campaign, coats, mittens, gloves, hats, scarves, as well as toiletries. And then to impact literacy, we have Books for Bins to be able to give children brand new books to be able to take home and call their own. They don't have to give them back. They also impact our teachers' libraries within their classrooms. The last one, which is warming and dear to my heart, is called The Hub. In our exchange, we have collaborative space where teachers come and they build collegiality. They build team. They come together as one, and they plan, and they strategize. And then, who doesn't like to go shopping? They go to the shelves, and they shop the shelves for books and resources for their classrooms and their teachers. Now, as we opened the one at Windsor Mill, someone said to me, well, Debbie, you need one on the east side of town. So again, in a partnership established with Federal Realty, we opened one at the Avenue at White Marsh. Again, bringing in American Design, but adding another 21st century vendor, Doron. Continuously increasing partnerships for our work in the district. When you take a look at this schematic, this was a pop-up shop. We opened this, we really, we planned this, to announce this at State of the Schools in March of 2020, but the schools closed, so we opened it, though, in the spring of 2021, and we were there for 18 months. We were told we had to move. Teachers were upset. It's like, what are we going to do now? Well, I go back to Scott Dorsey and say, Scott, I need brick and mortar. Do you have a piece of property on the east side of town that we can open for the exchangery? Within a week, we have a 2,700 square foot piece of property across from Golden Ring Middle School. Again, state of 21st century classroom furniture. The grand opening and the ribbon cutting will be coming up in June. We were able to move that in a month because what we had before, there was a tenant that was coming in.
Very warming, very dear to my heart to be able to impact our teachers and our principals and have a place where they can come and they can relax, have refreshments, and shop for their schoolhouse. Our third goal is that of advocacy, increase awareness, board development, conservation, and secession plan. You may say I'm a little bit dressed up for a board meeting tonight, but I was at a black tie function with the Baltimore County Bar Association prior to coming here. Why do I bring that up to you? I met them back in 2012 when I first became the executive director. In 2022, they adopted the foundation to be able to be their charity of choice for the year. All their fundraising efforts will come back to the foundation via check in June. Now, one, one, prince, one president wants to un outdo the other one. The last check last year was for $25,000. What will our check be? We will see in a few weeks. But anyway, increasing awareness is very important. I spend time going from people to people, coffee shop to coffee shop, restaurant to restaurant, meeting partners, having coffee, and telling stories about our students as a former educator and a former principal. But also, as we take a look at doing that, I work in the district and I, I report to the district for our community schools liaisons and various offices. I partner with our superintendent. As one Saturday, we presented to the doctoral students at University of Maryland College Park campus. That was an exciting time to be able to be together. Also, um, as we take a look at our work, we have impacted through the exchange in our programs, Battle Monument, St. Elizabeth, Maiden Choice. We had them come into our exchange and do school-to-work to transition programs. Our BCPSCT in interns, we've had 16 since I became the executive director. We want to make sure that we are extending that for the next generation of mentorship and leadership. So when you take a look at our awareness, we want to make sure that what is going to happen over these next couple of years is going to be sustained. We want to keep our partnership strong. We want to keep the foundation strong. And then when I took this, this foundation in 2012, I had 15 board members, 13 men, two women. I now have a board of 32 and proud to say that we are a very diverse board, age, ethnicity, race, age, and gender, and they are a working board because why? They believe in our children. They believe in our teachers and they believe in our schools. So it's an honor to be able to be here this evening as we take a look at our core values. We are strong ambassadors for the district. We're very proud of that. We are the preeminent charities. We want to be among the preeminent charities for advancement of education in our community. And you can tell by this small story with the Baltimore Bar Association, we have come up and we have become among the best. We want to make sure and we, our students deserve an equitable access of world-class education. And I'm very proud to say that the staff that I lead and the executive director and the executive uh, leadership and the board that I lead, they are very professional adults who are very compassionate about everything that we do within the foundation. I thank you for letting me be here this evening. I invite you to take a visit over to the exchangeries because once you come in, you'll become, get addicted to what it's all about and what we do for the district in Baltimore County. I want to tell you that the exchangery we have created, uh, myself and the other executive directors across the state, a program called Mind Over Matters, and when we share best practices. And when I have board members from other jurisdictions coming over and wanting to walk that exchange and see what we have, how did you do it, how can we replicate, it's very warming to my heart as executive director to serve this district. So come see us, visit our website, follow us on, so on social media, and be part of who we are because we support you and everything in the district. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for this time. Ms. Phelps, thank you, and thank you for the outstanding presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed my visit to the White Marsh Exchangery a couple of months back, and I can't wait to, to visit the new one as it opens. Um, so thank you. Julie, Julie thank yes. you. We had a great time, and we were together, and it was fun to be able to share everything that we were doing. So thank you for the visit. Thank you. Mr. Thomas, did you have something you wanted to say or add? Sure. 
Um, I just wanted to you. thank Ms. Phelps so much for um, everything she's doing in Baltimore County Public Schools and with the foundation. I had an incredible time at the Let's Play Ball event, visiting both Windsor Mill and the Avenue, getting to interact with the incredible team that Ms. Phelps has behind her. There are so many incredible um, former educators in BCPS that are really passionate about education after their time with us, and they're doing such incredible work with Ms. Phelps. So let's give her another round of applause. She is so incredible. Thank you so very much. And around the exchange, we, we do have a, a council of teachers that, are, that start with the planning and give ideas, because we only can get better, as well as advisory council of individuals that we meet quarterly to be able to talk public education and to be able to share information. So our, our awareness in the community is something that we are very proud of, that we want to encompass not only professionals and business people in the community, but also those who lead our schools, teach in our schools, work in our schools. So that's very important to us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Were members any comments or questions? Ms. Hen, it looks like there are some statements in the chat. Ms. Hen, I have a comment. Yes, Mr. McMillian. Ms. Phelps, you're amazing. I was at the, at the activity Saturday. And I, as soon as I made the turn off of York Road into the school, I was already like, wow. And then it occurred to me, after walking by the food trucks and seeing the allied kids and all the spectators and, and, and hanging out at the game, if you put your name, whatever you put your name on, put your stamp on, it's going to be a top flight activity. And I've been to White Marsh, and I'm just, you're amazing. Thank you very much for all you do for Baltimore County, the students and the teachers, and just thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Rod. You can't do without a great team, and I have a great team behind me, and I have great stories I can tell about each one of them, but they are just very vested in what we do, and they believe in what's happening here in Baltimore County. So it's, it's with great pride. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? I just want to thank you for everything you do in the county. Those exchanges are the most fantastic thing. I had I've been to one, the one in White Marsh, and it, 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 it's so great to think that there's a way that teachers don't have to take money out of their own pocket because they want to do something in a school, and maybe that school doesn't have a PTA that raises the kind of money that the other PTAs raise that they can fund some of these things. So that's great. And there was one teacher that, that had an idea and as you're here, I'll pass the idea on, is this idea of a mobile exchangery, where <laughs> you, you pack a bus. It's on our list. <laughs> is it? Oh, oh, I'm so glad. So I thought, as you're here, I'm just going to bring up the idea of a mobile exchange that goes to different schools, and then teachers can just come out and get what they want and, you know, do that. That would be an increase in staff. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it's something that we have put on the table that was brought up about going on in a mobile unit. Uh, it will take more volunteers. It will take more organization. But the sky is the limit as to what we're doing. We're, we're very excited about showcasing it to people. Um, and then to say, how did you get this all done? It's because, again, the team component behind and the opportunity to be innovative and the leadership that we have within the district to be able to give the foundation this open reign to be able to support in this way. So thank you very much, Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Ms. Mack? I just wanted to echo the comments from my other uh, fellow board members. Um, I think Mr. McMillian and I were with at the little library dedication at Lock Raven Academy. And as a result of that, I did try to visit the Windsor Mill location. And just for teachers who may be listening, are there any walk-in hours or do you have to register? So ours are, are twofold. Number one, we're always at um, Golden Ring on Tuesdays. Okay. We're always at Windsor Mill on Thursdays. So, and there are set shopping days that go through the BCPS hub. But through my presentations to various groups across the county, we do exclusive days at the exchangery, where if a principal or a teacher communicates with myself, we set up a time frame for them to come over during their lunch hour or during their planning period to shop. So we try to accommodate in every way possible. But to be able to have it opened every day is something that we're working on, but it just isn't, isn't you know, viable at this time. I certainly understand that, and I really thank you for all that you do. I have 
visited the White Marsh. I was there for the grand opening. Yes. And I did visit the Windsor Mill um, when I first got on the board. So it's just such an invaluable thing to do for our staff. And I really appreciate you and your staff. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Phelps, just wonderful to see you as always. Um, when I first joined the board, you were one of the first friendly, energetic faces uh, that I uh, really connected with. Um, you were everywhere, and so it was easy. <laughs> New teacher orientation, the Teacher of the Year program, uh, just a wonderful opportunity, and always so excited to showcase what are the amazing things that our teachers and students are doing and how the administrators and staff are supporting them. So I look forward to, uh, you know, seeing those things uh, in person as we keep in recovery and doing more activities. Um, and just for the entire community to understand what a wonderful conduit that your organization is for so many individuals, but also businesses and other community groups that want to support the public school system and creative, hardworking, organized, just a wonderful way to advocate for our children and our teachers um, and our school communities. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Chair Hien, I would like to just um, make a few comments. Um, first, I wanna thank the Education Foundation of BCPS because when we look at just what they're all about, board members, is a good example of a partnership, is working collaboratively with the school system, looking at the needs, working with our school leaders, working with the senior leadership to, to discuss ways to improve teaching and learning and the collaboration. So I wanna thank that partnership because it's not happening in every school system. So we are fortunate, as Ms. Phelps talked about our presentation to grad students also want to thank the executive board. I attended their last meeting and their involvement is 100%. And every meeting at the end, they review their core values because they want all members to understand their purpose. And I think I said to them, thank you for doing that. That is something that we all should practice and learn and do every time we have a meeting to look at what is our core value? Why are we doing the work? And lastly, I wanna thank Ms. Debbie Phelps um, for her leadership over 30 plus years of service. I won't give the exact number, but we wanna thank you for your leadership and all that you do for Team BCPS because it impacts our students and our staff. And however we can develop and continue to strengthen that partnership, we are constantly having communication. So I just wanna thank you for taking on this request of mine to present to the board about the foundation because there are great things happening when we partner and work together to really deal with the needs of our students and staff. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Appreciate that. <coughs> thank you, Dr. Williams. And thank you again, Ms. Phelps. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you both. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the update on the efficiency and effectiveness review. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams and Dr. Yarborough. So good evening, Board Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, members of the board. Tonight I present update number seven of a clear path forward, our system plan to address needs outlined in the Public Works Operational Efficiency Review. Our plan is aligned with the blueprint, of, blueprint for Maryland's future with the goal of positioning Baltimore County Public Schools as a premier school system. My goal is to provide an update on our progress with respect to assessing, adopting, and implementing recommendations outlined in the 759-page report. So we know, next slide, please. We know that our efforts to heal, rebuild, and recover must be ongoing. 
On March 22nd, our Deputy Superintendent, Dr. Yarborough, provided a status report on the efficiency review. Next slide. This slide details the BCPS response to the efficiency report received in September from Public Works LLC. On September 14th, our articulated BCPS commitments to Team BCPS. We have taken several steps as a system to employ a studied, balanced approach to review and implement recommendations. As you can see from this slide, our work began in September. There has been a sustained commitment to implementing the process with fidelity through the year culminating with the final report. Next slide. Stakeholders have been an integral part of this process from the very beginning. Our review and analysis has been informed by multiple voices at each step. Each work group was co-facilitated by an equity specialist and division director or executive director who work together to incorporate all voices while ensuring fidelity to the process. All work groups re reviewed recommendations, identified priorities where appropriate, charted a course of implementation of next steps. We appreciate the input of work group members, including division and department staff members, union representatives in all phases, Blueprint for Maryland's Future, content experts, parent stakeholder group representatives, and student leaders. Their participation ensured that true collaboration occurred to, in, occurred to include multiple perspectives while respecting content expertise and the impact on Team BCPS. Tonight, I invite uh, Deputy Superintendent Dr. Yarborough, our Chief of Staff, Ms. Charlie Green, and Ms. Onijala, our Senior Communications Director, to provide a report that details our current implementation status and an overview of our comprehensive communications and climate and morale plans for Team BCPS. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Good evening, Board Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the Board. On September 14th, Dr. Williams committed to the following outcomes related to the efficiency review report. Significant cost savings focused on operational efficiency, a reorganization of central office staff to ensure the effective and efficient provision of services to schools, a comprehensive collaborative plan to improve staff morale, communication, and stakeholder satisfaction. To date, items number one and two have been completed and we will share information about number three this evening. As stated pre previously, responsible cost reductions in the amount of $7.7 million have been completed. These savings include a reduction of nine FTEs, totaling $1.7 million through the reorganization of cabinet and $6 million through device cost reductions. Next slide, please. This slide represents the reorganized cabinet reporting structure in alignment with the recommendations from the efficiency report. The new positions of deputy superintendent, chief financial officer, and chief information officer were approved by the Board of Education on October 26, 2021. In accordance with policy 2310, the positions that report directly to the superintendent and positions at the executive director level and above will be presented in June for board approval. Next slide, please. Examination of the recommendation types revealed the following. The report included 131 recommendations that were process efficiencies. 38, or 19.3%, were efficiencies with final impl financial implications, excuse me. Savings, 17 recommendations, 11 that were categorized as other, including the morale plan and communications plan. As you know, the overall rate of implementation averages 80% across school districts. As of May 13, 
2022, 191 recommendations have a final determination. Baltimore County Public Schools has moved forward 169 items or 88 and a half percent with a yes. This exceeds implementation average by more than 8 percent. 10 percent or 19 items have moved forward with a no and 2 percent three items with a determination to hold for further review and consideration in FY24. Six items are pending Board of Education action. As of May 13th, 191 recommendations have a designated implementation status. This slide provides a summary of those actions that have been completed those that are in progress, and those with a start date beginning this spring. The final report includes a detailed description of each recommendation and the associated timeline. Next slide, please. The final report representing nine months of work and the collaboration of hundreds of stakeholders will be posted on our website tomorrow. In addition to providing background information and specifics regarding our process, it details every recommendation. While it is infeasible to review 197 recommendations in this venue, the public is encouraged to review the report for a final accounting of the steps that we are taking as a system to improve efficiency and effectiveness. In the report for each item, you will find the original recommendation, the type of recommendation, the final outcome, implementation status, initial review and implementation timeline, as well as notes as appropriate. In addition to the 197 recommendations focused on operational areas, Public Works identified several themes across divisions that should be addressed as a part of BCPS's ongoing work. Two of those themes, communications and employee morale, are included in this evening's report. At this time, I invite Ms. Charlie Green and Ms. Onijala to present the communications plan overview. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. And once again, good evening, Board Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. As we address needs outlined in the Public Works Operational Efficiency Review and continue to position Baltimore County schools as a premier school system, our success, we know, will be dependent upon efforts to build relationships across school communities, offices and facilities, and the greater community. Positive and productive relationships are built through meaningful communication and engagement. All members of Team BCPS are vital to our success. Tonight, we will highlight critical work that is underway to address system-wide communication needs and employee climate and morale. At this time, I invite Ms. Onijala to share details about our strategic communications planning for effective engagement with Team BCPS. Thank you, Ms. Charlie Green. Good evening, Dr. Williams and members of the board. After joining Team BCPS in September, I had several conversations with leadership about the state of communications for the system, challenges, and opportunities. The Chief of Staff explained the work that was underway to address the recommendations of the efficiency review. She shared that there were specific items and recommendations that were um, communications related that would require immediate attention. As I read through the review findings and also did some informal canvassing of our processes, platforms, and tools, I realized it would be important to do a formal assessment of our stakeholders' perceptions of and experiences with system communications. Our team determined that part of that formal assessment would need to be a communications questionnaire for staff and the community that would assess how BCPS can better share information with Team BCPS, staff, students, families, and the community at large. And so, with Dr. Williams' approval, we launched the questionnaire on December 22nd, 2021. We received nearly 1,900 responses from the community and approximately 1,250 responses from staff. And the responses provided a wealth of feedback on what our stakeholders believe creates barriers to access and lead to negative communication and customer service experiences. 
The efficiency review findings and data from the qu communications questionnaire will drive communication strategy moving forward. The work of the Department of Communications and Community Outreach will be focused on the five key areas that you see on the screen. They are aligned to the goals outlined in our strategic plan, focus area four, community engagement and partnerships, and address the findings and recommendations of Public Works LLC specific to the communication needs of the system. The five areas are improve accessibility for stakeholders, enhance engagement and strengthen communications, expand direct outreach to students, enhance central office collaboration, and cultivate stronger interagency partnerships. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Improving accessibility for all members of Team BCPS. <clears throat> This focus area is about rethinking mechanisms and platforms for outreach that allow more people to engage in critical system content as efficiently as possible. Additionally, we want to take a deeper look at how we differentiate our messages and adjust our content across various platforms to meet the needs of our diverse community. I will now highlight some of the proposed tools to address barriers, uh, to address the barriers to accessing information. This begins with a complete redesign of the BCPS website and school websites, and also the launch of a new BCPS mobile application. What you see on the screen is a mock-up of the redesigned website. We've heard from our community, staff, and families that our current website design is difficult to navigate. It is important to note that the web team had to completely rebuild the site following the cyber attack. It was a massive undertaking. But as we rebuild and heal, we must address the areas of communication that aren't working for Team BCPS. And the website is one of the most important areas. Our work is guided by best practices for website design. Key information should be no more than two clicks away. It is also critical to engage an analytic tool to measure where our website visitors are spending their time and put those links front and center. While the work on redesigning the website will take us into the fall, we have already begun to make some noticeable changes to the website. This includes an improved search function as well as the improved placement of key resources and links right on the BCPS homepage. Accessibility also means a standard practice of translating all key system messages and alerts in Spanish and sharing both messages at the same time on our website and via our various messaging platforms. I will provide greater detail on our outreach to Spanish-speaking families in just a little bit. I am also pleased to share that we are working with Swagit Productions to enhance community access to board meetings, community town halls, virtual conversations, and more. Swagit will provide us with the ability to embed live streaming videos directly on our homepage. Next slide, please. For the focus area of enhancing parent, staff, and community engagement and strengthening communications, we will provide more targeted outreach to parents, staff, and the community by leveraging underutilized and new communication tools. This will include a new weekly staff newsletter and a bi-weekly newsletter that will be sent to all BCPS parents and guardians. We are leveraging text messages via School Messenger and alerts via the Parent Focus Portal and Schoology. These tools currently have not been utilized to their full internal and external communication potential. A big part of this work will be building engagement with Spanish-speaking families through traditional media, digital media, collaboration with county agencies, nonprofit organizations, and more. Our new bilingual senior communications officer, who will lead much of this work, started on April 4th and has hit the ground running. We have more than 11,000 English learners in BCPS and more than 20,000 BCPS students have identified themselves as speaking another language. Of the 20,000, 11,000 of those speak Spanish. From 2016 to 2021, the percentage of Spanish-speaking EL students grew from 55 to 68%. We want to ensure that we are meeting the, communi the communication needs of this rapidly growing population and providing timely, culturally competent resources and information. Next slide, please. 
In the short time that we have had our bilingual senior communications officer on board, we have established relationships with local Spanish media who want to partner with us to provide BCPS families with critical news and information about the system. Recent interviews with Somos Baltimore Latino and El Zol 107.9 provided an opportunity for the communications team to share resources and information on how to navigate the school system. As you see on the screen, we have been sharing translated news releases with the community and posting them on the BCPS website. We have also started providing BCPS exposure, uh, exposure blog stories in Spanish. We are tentatively set to launch a new Facebook Live news show in Spanish called Noticieros BCPS on Wednesday, May 25th. Really excited about that. <laughs> this will be a weekly show where our senior bilingual communications officer will cover important topics like enrollment, BCPS programs, services, and much more. We are also exploring the creation of a Spanish language mini website and actively, actively soliciting the feedback, suggestions, and input from Spanish speaking parents on what they would like to see on the website. That's critical. Next slide, please. For our focus area on enhancing central office collaboration, we want to establish processes that enable cross-office, cross-division collaboration to identify critical areas of communication for the system and develop deliverables that equip offices and schools to serve as effective ambassadors. This will provide more coordinated and seamless communication for the end user to increase transparency across Team BCPS. This year, the communications team and the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency have worked together to provide professional development for principals, assistant principals, and staff development teachers on standards of excellence. This PD has focused on building a shared vision for operational excellence, focused on relational trust, effective communication, and collaborative leadership. We've covered the following key components, communication, customer service, relationships, innovative problem solving, and mutual accountability. And we believe that through these continued conversations on what excellence means for Team BCPS, we will have a shared understanding, shared commitments, and shared values that guide all of our work as a school system. Next slide, please. For this focus area on expanding direct outreach to students. We want to leverage underutilized tools to engage with students, solicit feedback, and provide information on system initiatives, programs, and events that are of importance to our students. We need to provide opportunities for two-way conversations with leadership. Why? Because our purpose is ensuring student success, and students are often overlooked in their ability to be effective ambassadors of key system messages. Some ways in which we will accomplish this, through direct student messaging and student engagement in collaboration with the student member of the board. We've done a lot this year with Christian. He has been a tremendous partner in this work. Thank you, Christian. Student journalist roundtables, where Dr. Williams will have an opportunity to speak with some of our students who are writing for their school papers to talk about some of the system initiatives and work. We've launched an information campaign on Outlook accounts for secondary students. We found out that students didn't realize they had access to some of these email accounts and that we as a system be, could provide some information to them directly. We've been posting on Schoology, you'll see an example on the screen, where we're getting thousands of, of uh, likes and, and, and comments on posts about the small election, on posts about early closure. Who doesn't love an early closure day, right? Uh, but we're seeing that students want to engage with this content, and so we're leveraging these tools that have existed but haven't been utilized in this manner before. We're working with student councils on joint campaigns, including mental health campaigns and campaigns around safety. Next slide, please. For this focus area of cultivating stronger interagency partnerships, we believe that improved collaboration with the communication counterparts in the county council, the county executive's office, other county agencies will enable us to provide timely and accurate communication in crises, amplify core messaging, and leverage resources to improve effectiveness and efficiency and connect with the community at a deeper level. An example of the importance of a stronger interagency partnership is the announcement of the new Baltimore County Emergency Alert System. 
The alert system will include BCPS-related information, and we have been in, co in contact with the county's emergency management planner to coordinate efforts and ensure accuracy in the information that is shared. BCPS is also working closely with the county's Immigration Affairs Outreach Coordinator to coordinate services and outreach to immigrant families. We recently joined the county's new American Advisory Group and are learning more about the various agencies, nonprofit groups, and organizations that serve Spanish-speaking BCPS families. Agencies such as the Esperanza Center, a comprehensive resource center whose mission is to welcome immigrants by offering hope, compassionate services, and the power to improve their lives. We will identify community festivals and events for Spanish-speaking county residents where we can set up BCPS, uh, the BCPS parent mobile or an information table and provide important resources and information. Next slide, please. Here on the screen, you will see an outline of the work already underway, as well as highlights of the work to come. As I mentioned earlier, we have been making enhancements on the website in our design, of messages and delivery and much more. You may be noticing more frequent text messages about BCPS related news, again, an effort to make sure that we're hitting our families across all platforms. Uh, and this has been in direct response to the feedback we have received from staff, families, the community, and you members of the Board of Education, and areas of concern that have been outlined in the efficiency review. This work is ongoing, and we believe this plan that focuses on improving accessibility for all members of Team BCPS, enhancing parent, staff, and community engagement, and strengthening communications, expanding direct outreach to students, enhancing our central office collaboration, and cultivating stronger interagency partnerships will help ensure that all members of Team BCPS are connected to our system. How will we measure our effectiveness? We're going to be tracking website analytics, the number of newsletter opens and click-throughs, but most importantly, in my opinion, building in opportunities for ongoing feedback on communications through targeted questionnaires, focus groups, live community town halls where we are taking questions live on YouTube, not you know, uh, receiving those questions and being able to answer them directly, drop-in sessions, and more. Our bilingual senior communications officer is also establishing a parent focus group for Spanish-speaking families to provide frequent feedback and insight on system communication. Thank you for this opportunity to share some highlights of this critical work. I will now turn it over to Dr. Yarbrough, who will provide information on the Comprehensive Climate and Morale Plan. Thank you, Ms. Onajala. In the fall, we began working with division with our union partners to identify the next steps for the development of a comprehensive plan to improve staff climate and morale. Each union president worked with, mem with its membership to identify the top concerns, potential solutions, and ideal state. Organizational effectiveness also hosted nine focus groups for non-represented staff to gather their input and feedback. Our plan identifies four areas of focus for the upcoming year. Organizational climate, engagement, recognition, and wellness. In the spirit of continuous improvement, we commit to ongoing dialogue and feedback on our process and our progress throughout the school year on behalf of our staff members. Next slide, please. Organizational climate is the attitude, satisfaction, and overall outlook of employees about their interaction with BCPS as a whole. Morale has a direct impact on productivity. We will work together to reestablish a culture that values customer service. Specifically, we will commit to a standard of 24 to 48 hours response time to queries received across Team BCPS from all stakeholders and create robust opportunities for team building throughout the year to reconnect to a common purpose. Components of positive organizational climate must include ongoing feedback, which we will receive from our union partners, stakeholder groups, advisory groups, student leaders, families, leadership development, 
appreciation and recognition, and further development of positive relationships that help all members of Team BCPS identify with our collective identity. Next slide, please. Engagement is the level of enthusiasm and dedication an employee feels towards their job. We know that engaged staff achieve better results no matter what the position is. In order to achieve that, we are going to focus on the adults specific to each and every single work site across Team BCPS. Teams will work collaboratively to create the climate and conditions for success. Schools and offices will analyze engagement data and feedback from staff members and create specific goals as part of the existing school and office progress planning process. And we will commit to monitoring our progress through ongoing feedback from educator council and office teams to review and adjust the plan as needed throughout the year. Recognition is the open acknowledgement and appreciation of staff contributions to the success of Team BCPS. The Office of Communications will partner with organizational effectiveness to expand efforts to highlight the outstanding and hardworking members of Team BCPS. The recognition will take multiple forms, including recognition from peers, leaders, and system-wide acknowledgement of service milestones to celebrate our employees. These efforts will celebrate well-deserving staff who exemplify our core values and make BCPS a better place. Next slide, please. BCPS values every student, employee, and community member. Our goal is to provide an organizational culture and climate that is supportive, safe, and healthy. This fall, staff will have additional resources focused on mental health and well-being. In addition to the expansion of BCPS Connects and our Employee Assistance Program, we are excited about adding Health Fairs Plus and SELW Bounce Back. Health Fairs Plus is an innovative online corporate wellness resource to provide employees access to health and wellness webinars and activities to offer employees a secure and easy means of accessing health and wellness resources. Employees can participate in various wellness challenges, which include fitness, nutrition, stress, relaxation, stress relief, relaxation, and financial literacy. Bounce Back is an easy to use stress management platform created for educators, administrators, and support employees. This new customized wellness program is designed to help employees manage and reduce stress developed in collaboration with CASEL in response to the pandemic. Together with our union partners, we believe a coordinated focus on these key areas will help us to improve climate and morale across Team BCPS. At this time, I will turn it back over to Dr. Williams. So as we continue to engage with union leadership regarding the upcoming year, we have received positive feedback that ongoing opportunities to provide wellness breaks to staff during the year were appreciated and the need exists for similar practices for this upcoming year. We also know that advance notice to families is greatly appreciated for planning purposes. For board consideration, we would like to offer the following for next year. November 23rd of 2020, let me try it again. November 23rd of 2022, schools and offices close and staff wellness breaks in recognition of efforts three hours early release on Thursday, December 22nd of 2022, Friday, March 17th of 2023, and Friday, May 19th, 2023. We will continue to offer the gift of time and remote options on days with no students. Lastly, we will continue to explore additional opportunities for this upcoming year. So the last nine months, next slide please, uh, have represented an opportunity to examine practices in BCPS and work collaboratively with all of our stakeholders as we have navigated the analysis and implementation of the efficiency review recommendations. We really wanna thank all of our stakeholders for the input and engagement as we work together for the betterment of our system. We will continue to update the board, our community and team BCPS during these changing times. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the updates and the outstanding presentation. 
Um, board members, any questions or comments? Ms. Rowe and then Dr. Hager. So I noticed that um, the law had passed allowing school systems to use um, snow days as virtual learning. And I wondered if we had considered doing that so that we wouldn't have to extend the school year. So last year we received the information from MSDE that said it was temporary only for this year. To my knowledge, we have not received um, information regarding moving forward. I am sure under the direction of Dr. Williams, once we receive that information, we would again notify the board and follow the processes as recommended by the State Department um, so, regarding our next step. I believe it was a law just passed by the General Assembly this session. Okay. So you, you'll see it yes, in it the was, information. It is a law, but we, we also do need to hear from our state board um, and our state superintendent. So mm -hmm. as Dr. Yarbrough is saying, all we need is this additional clarification okay. about how to proceed. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, Ms. Onojala, I am so excited about you being here. So you just started in September, right? I'm so impressed with the work that you've done and very excited as a parent of three kids who've over time been in three different schools. Um, I've gotten three different sets of text emails, um, you name it, Schoology Alerts on the same topic, usually like a haiku contest or something, and it's just flooding my inbox. So I just really appreciate streamlining everything um, in the work that you described. Uh, two comments. One is, um, who is it that maintains the school level websites? So each school has a webmaster supported by the web team, it's a web team of two people, <laughs> the Department of Communications, um, but each school each, every year dedicates a staff member to serve as the webmaster. So someone who's already doing another job. Someone too. who's already doing another job. <laughs> just, just making sure, <laughs> yes. um, because that is an area that I, I'm sure others have commented that could, could be improved. Yes. Um, and then I just wanted to say that this, and especially in, in recent months, and I'm sure this isn't a surprise to anyone, um, most of the communication we've gotten is about busing. Mm -hmm text messages, mm -hmm. multiple emails, and it ends up meaning that things get lost that are maybe, not that everyday busing is very important urgently in the moment, you know, but, um, but it just as a comment, that could be a way that we could build off of the technology we've been using to notify parents about busing as, as we move forward, um, because I definitely get all of those messages, which is a good thing, because I need thank to get those. So, thank so you, anyway, Dr. thank Dr. you for all your work that you're thank doing. You. Thank, you. thank you. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. I just also wanted to say thank you so much for everything this entire year, uh, Boyende. You've been an incredible asset to the team, and I've loved working with you this whole year. Um, I do have one question, and it is, what are some of your plans in the Office of Family and Community Engagement, um, or just as the senior communication specialist, um, to continue to engage students, uh, maybe bes besides what was on the slide there, or what are some of the things that you've noticed this year? Can you expand on that? Absolutely. So some of the work with FACE um, will also include expanding our um, offerings in Spanish and ensuring that those offerings are uh, culturally competent and ensuring that those the, the resources and information are actually meeting the needs of the community. And so what um, Ms. Han, who leads the work uh, around our parent university and uh, family engagement, has just done a tremendous job ensuring that there's diversity in the offerings of workshops, but we know that we could do more, right? And so working with our new bilingual senior communications officer, we are finding uh, new resources in the community, people who could come in, provide trainings for our parents. Um, and then on the student leadership side, I know that in Ms. Mer Murray's remarks this evening that were delivered by Samantha, her desire and her, ho her hope is to expand leadership opportunities to our elementary students. So partnering with her around that work to see how we can uh, potentially expand some of those programs and offerings to our youngest learners. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, Mr. McMillian. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I want to piggyback on what Dr. Hager said about the webmasters, the end school webmasters. That is a critical position, as you very well know, because having been in a high school for 25 years, you know, those people change and, and they have other responsibilities. And if they don't stay on top of that, that website before you know it in a matter of, you know, a days or weeks, they're behind and the public's behind and that's the gap between the communication between the public and the school is that, that gap. 
So thank you for acknowledging that, and thank you for all your work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Thank you. Uh, and thank you for this presentation, um, Dr. Williams, as well. My question is to the chair. There were a lot of recommendations in the efficiency review for the board to do as well. And the previous chair, Ms. Scott, actually had started implementing some of those recommendations, i.e., she uh, helped for, uh, facilitate the civility code. She helped bring forward the handbook, social media policy, but there's still a lot of recommendations. And my question is to the board, where are we with those recommendations? One was superintendent evaluation um, to be done in a timely manner, micromanagement. So is there um, any presentation or action sure. plans coming forward for the board's recommendation as well? Thank you, Ms. Joes. So I had asked um, several board members to serve on an ad hoc committee um, dedicated to implementing the recommendations of the efficiency review. And to date, only one board member has accepted um, my request to lead that effort, and that is Mrs. Causey. So I want to publicly acknowledge Mrs. Causey's willingness to serve on that. Hopefully more board members will step up to assist her. Um, she and I have been working together to identify resources that are needed um, so this is not a one-woman effort um, by any means, so we have started to identify resources, including some resources that will involve um, some expense from the board's budget, since we do need resources to assist us in implementing the recommendations. So we will be bringing those um, recommendations to further the work to the board, um, in addition to proposals that we need to get to accomplish the work. So I do hope that more board members will step up and offer their assistance to Mrs. Causey um, because there is work to be done. But we have um, started to identify internal resources as well as external on several of the items and are in discussions to get estimates and proposals and um, mostly to identify resources at this point. Because as you know, the board does not have the staff that the superintendent does and we are not full-time employees of the system, so it's it's more challenging. So hopefully more board members will step up and be able to assist. And again, thank you, Mrs. Causey, for your work so far. Um, so, Ms. Hen, what is the timeline of bringing that to the board? We will update the board as we are able to make progress. As I said, it's been one I had hoped to have more um, members willing to serve on that ad hoc. and. That has not happened, so we will be bringing updates to future board meetings. Ms. Mack, you were next. Thank you very much for this presentation, and thank you for your enthusiasm. Um, it's wonderful to see. Quick question and then a comment. Um, when we send out questionnaires, in the past we used to have an area for free flow. Did the questionnaire that you referenced in December have an area for people to write comments? Some some questions uh, provided an uh, opportunity for long form answers where they could really share some of their frustrations or you know things that they've observed. We didn't have just a general comment box, but the way in which we designed the questionnaire allowed for um, additional comments beyond just a yes or no answer. And do we ensure that um, surveys that staff provide feedback on, uh, do we ensure their anonymity? We did not ask for name okay. or position, but with it being a Microsoft form, they would, of course, log in using their BCPS oh. account. But I did not go in and check, try and match emails to names or I'm, anything I'm like sure that. I'm sure you so, didn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I often hear from teachers that, and, and I'm wondering if you do and if you're going to plan to address it, that there's so much that happens in a school day that is non-value added. Um, and, and the example that I often get is having an objective statement on the board in a kindergarten class um, where students can't read, um, they can't read the objective statement, um, and it takes time for the educator to put that up there. And I, I understand that, yes, the educator, him or herself, can refer to it, but it's just we often hear our union leaders speak to the board and say, let us do what we were hired to do and get rid of the non-value added stuff. Did any of that come out in the survey and do you have plans to address any of that? 
Well, I wouldn't say those specific examples came up, but what I would say that we heard from staff loud and clear was that in the course of the day, they have so many responsibilities. And if we're sending 10 different messages, there isn't time to read through all of that and understand what's going on in the system. And so that's why a response, one of the things that we're going to be focusing on is a dedicated staff newsletter that you can then go back, search by keywords at your time to say, oh, I know they sent me something about W-2s, but I can't remember what that email said, but now you actually have a website where you can search and find the information. So we heard more of the, there's so much information coming at me really, really fast. It's hard to kind of sort through it all. It gets lost in my email. I need a dedicated place to be able to search for information that's important to me as a staff member. And so that is what we plan on addressing. And I appreciate that. I guess I'm look, um, I was worked on a business process engineering team, and we looked at ways to do things better, differently, more efficiently, and more customer focused. And I, I guess I'm asking that we consider that in the future to get input from our employees to say, what do you do every day? What are you required to do every day that does not have any benefit to student outcomes or student? Um, wellness or something like that. Uh, it's, and I'm not expecting you to answer. I'm just throwing that out there. Thank you. Well, let me, let me jump in. So I would always say that every school has some type of climate committee or educators council that these questions and concerns, that's the purpose of those groups, to really problem solve. But your point about the objective, Ms. Mack, I need to respond. That's good pedagogy. That's what teachers learn about how to write an objective and then how administrators and other teachers know what's happening. And more importantly, as I go in classrooms and I can turn to a student and say, what are you learning today? Whether it's kindergarten to 12th grade, they are always referencing that objective. So I wouldn't necessarily classify posting an objective as a non-value added responsibility. That is what we've learned as we've gone through our teacher ed, how to write an effective objective, and then how to assess at the end of the lesson whether the students learn that objective, which more than likely, Dr. Boswell McComas, is tied to the standard because we want to make sure our students are learning the standard. So I would just offer, as you're talking to staff and they, they're making comments to you, please, please encourage them to reach out to their climate committee, the educators' council, their administrator, their department chair, to help them problem solve some of their co concerns or to, to answer some of their questions. But I just want to offer that based on your feedback. And thank you, uh, Buende, for responding to that question. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Causey and then Ms. Scott. Good evening, and thank you very much for um, this presentation. and. Um, Again, kudos, I'll echo um, about enthusiasm and a lot of uh, the very positive things that you said. Related to our English um, learners, I had the opportunity to do junior interviews at one of our high schools. Um, and one of the things that I uh, recommended to a couple of the students who are um, English learners was the seal of biliteracy that um, our school system is promoting, and none of them had heard of it. So it's a wonderful opportunity for these students that are coming already with a valuable skill that just needs to be um, helped along the way to meet, to meet that uh, seal of biliteracy. So hopefully that's something that can really um, get channeled through that, um, through all that you're doing. So that's great. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about is if you could go back to slide um, 24 related to wellness. So is um, this going to go through the school wellness um, councils? How is this going to get out into the, the schools? And, or did in ideas come up? How, I just want to hear a little more about that. Sure. So um, we have a combination uh, response here. So BCPS Connects this upcoming year will be the third year, and it started as a response to the pandemic. What are the needs of our staff members? And we are bringing in speakers on a variety of topics, and we've expanded that. We also have um, employee assistance program 
that you're very familiar with those components, and uh, Ms. Anderson as well as Ms. Zimmerman have done an excellent job of providing a variety of online aspects. The two pieces that are new, um, one through partnership with uh, Cigna is the Health Fairs Plus, the virtual platform, and that's for all staff across Team BCPS, because one of the things that we want to make sure that's clear in the climate and morale plan is that we care about our educators that are inside of the classroom as well as outside of the classroom. So as we um, you know, continue to engage with them and learn about different ways where it can be office challenges, school challenges, et cetera, um, those will be different ways that we bring them above. But we are not going to add a burden on a school that wellness is good for you, but here's another job that you have to do. So we are going to work together um, with our partners to introduce that and then bounce back, um, which is very exciting. That um, is developed by a group of educators, and it is directly for educators managing stress related to the pandemic. So that one starts with sort of a small battery of um, questions, and then based on informal um, not informal, anonymous responses, they're sort of, here are some suggestions of things that you can do to help relieve the stress in the moment. So when you need to take that minute to take a break, in addition to you know just going out to take that minute, you sh can look into your phone and then engage in a mindfulness exercise. So really, this is about a coordinated effort to make sure that everyone has what they need. And as our, um, you know, we move to an endemic response and things start to open up more. We're also looking forward to providing those face-to-face -face opportunities for staff to engage in team building as well as wellness um, activities. So we will absolutely have the wellness team. We will be partnering with leaders to find out what their um, suggestions are, but it is not our goal to sort of hand this to the school and say, here is some extra work for you. We really are looking to um, take that lift on for them and make this value added in terms of how we move through the impact of this pandemic. Well, that's fantastic. So let me just add just that. one more thing. This won't preclude the work of the local schools. You know, local schools will be doing those activities that they have been doing for years, like the chili cook-off, the Friday dress-up, going to the events, those things of that relationship with students and activities will continue at every school. Every school has its own climate and tradition. So I just want to put that out there as, as well, that uh, schools will still be very creative in what they're doing to support students and staff. Thank you. And I just had two more things. And the um, next one is the board receives um, emails, and they come um, in batches, if you will, related to interests, topics, um, issues that are arising. And one of the things that uh, board members have um, talked about is developing a process, because we only have one staff member, mm -hmm. to, in a timely way, really uh, review those and then assemble that information for the board in, in a timely fashion. I mean, we've had 4,000 emails in three days come in about a, uh, from staff about an issue. So that would be important. That's all the time I have. But thank you very much. So is there is that part of your you. thought process? I think that that's is, a follow up for yeah. the board and a board retreat to talk about just managing mm -hmm. those emails. If you go back and look at the report, the report was very clear about the communication and climate. And so that's what the team responded. But I think we will just have a, a, a additional conversations um, as board leadership with the full board about those next steps. There is a protocol within the handbook about communications, um, but it's always room for improvement. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you. thank you, Ms. Scott. Yes, thank you. And thank you very much for this presentation. It's very well done. Um, my question is, as it always is, is. Um, in regards to the efficiency review um, as it relates to the board. And I guess my question would be, again, from the chair, I understand that you said that you put together a committee, I guess, to address some of the um, 
concern or, or some of the things that came up in the efficiency review. But as I'm reviewing it, it says that the board chair should um, work with the superintendent, and it specifically says the board chair. And it sounded like what you were saying is that a committee, you put together a committee to work on it instead of the board chair working on it. And uh, and I just wanted to understand if I heard you correctly and that what you're um, what you're recommending that we do as a board is form a committee to address it as opposed to the board chair addressing it um, and implementing it with the super superintendent. Ms. Scott, I'll respond to your question, even though I've responded to it and it is off topic for the presentation. I'll be providing an update. I work with the ad hoc. I stated that I've worked with Mrs. Causey. I've asked members to serve on this committee. They turned down my request. I believe you were one of the members I asked to serve on this committee, since clearly you are very engaged and interested in the efficiency review. So I am working with Mrs. Causey on these recommendations, and I do hope that board members will step up because we do need help with that. So an update will be forthcoming. However, given the limited resources and the limited numbers of members who are willing to help, it our progress is slowed by that. So Okay, and thank you very much for that. I'm just going over um, the recommendation that came, like one of the ones for um, the superintendent's evaluation. It says the board chair should submit a superintendent's performance review instrument. The board chair okay. should review, revise, and, and approve. And so when you said a committee, which you're right, you did um, um, bring that up, or an ad hoc committee, um, I was just wanting to get clarification if that committee was going to do the work in lieu of the recommendation that the board chair do it. So you've spoken to it. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank you. And the, the report also references the superintendent, and he has formed um, work groups around all of his items as well. So the while that references the board chair, we are a 12-member board, and it is the work of many. So I appreciate your question and the opportunity to clarify. Um, Mr. Offerman, I believe, has, has exited. I didn't know if he had any comments or questions before he needed to, to leave us. Um, if he's still there, Mr. Offerman, if you have anything you wish to add. Okay. Ms. Joes, you had a follow-up? And Mr. Yes, McMahon. thank you. I heard you say a lot about fiscal impacts, but a lot of these recommendations don't have a fiscal impact. For instance, uh, we've already paid up MAPE dues, and we've not had a retreat scheduled this year. We usually have one in January. We've not had a, a meeting or a retreat this scheduled. Not, this is not related to the presentation we just heard. So if you have comments or questions on the presentation, I'll entertain those. Otherwise, this is off topic. You were one of the presenters in the presenter, so I was hoping to see an update on the board's recommendations as well. And, and that's not course, in the presentation. So you will receive that update when the board update is given. Um, Mr. McMillian, your statement. Yeah, very briefly, Ms. Mack, I was a teacher who disliked writing objectives, but I must admit they, were, they focus and direct the lesson. That's all I want to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Kuhn, did you have anything you wanted to add before you needed to depart? Okay. Mr. Thomas? No? Okay. Anyone who has not yet had a chance to speak, I want to make sure you are not missed. I just want okay. to bring um, to the board attention I made a, a statement, and I want to go back to that statement, that um, we do want to propose three, one, two, three, three days of an early release next year. That was great feedback from many stakeholders. I don't think anybody complained. The dates, again, are uh, Thursday, December 22nd, Friday, March 17th of 2023 and Friday, May 19th of 2023. And then the last request is to close schools and offices on November 23 of 2022. These are all four dates of next year. 
November 20. Um, Dr. Williams, if we take one day off of the calendar, do we have to add a day on then? Can Ms. we make Charlie this? Green. Can we make this happen now, or do we need to like see the calendar and you know? Ms. Charlie Green, are you able to respond to that or? So we did. So so we would have to get back to you on that. We did send the dates to uh, Mr. Duke. We are looking at those. Um, so we may have to delay action, Dr. Williams, on at least that one day. My apologies. But we could make we could move make. Sorry, I'm tired. <laughs> we can move forward with the three half days. We can move forward with the three half days, and we certainly could, you know, pending make a recommendation pending, um, you know, a positive outcome of the conversation related to the calendar. So, so thank you for that clarity. I think the feedback from my families wanted to have as much head notice yes, that is in correct. advance. Yes. So to your point, I think we can move if the board so desire with the early release days and then follow up with that day of November 23rd, if we have to make that up on the back end. And is that a motion that needs to be made? Mm -hmm. I didn't press enter. I didn't oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Go ahead, Christian. <laughs> yep. Yes. I Mr. apologize. Um, thank you. Uh, I press enter by accident, but is it okay for me to put in the chat? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I move that the superintendent's recommendations for early release on Thursday, December 22nd, 2022, Friday, March 17th, 2023, Friday, May 19th, 2023, for the 2022 to 2023 school year be adopted. I second the motion. Aaron Hager. Yeah. And who was that, Dr. Hager? Um, I have a question from Mr. Bruce Ades regarding whether this motion is permissible outside of the board's calendar discussions or within the, the context of this discussion now? I'm not following your question. Is the motion permissible at this time? I, I think it would fall under like the morale discussion uh, that has been going on today. Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Causey, and then Mr. Thomas, if you wanted to speak on your motion. Oh, Mr. Thomas may speak to his motion first. Sure. Thank you. Uh, assuming with the, and I'd like Dr. Williams to clarify with this, assuming that we have the extra 15 days, I'm assuming that this wouldn't have an impact on the remainder of the school year. I'm sorry, the extra 15 minutes on the calendar still, this would not have an impact on extending the school year based on the same um, motion that was made earlier this year for this school year. And uh, we, this is the exact same thing we did earlier this school year when we were approving the three half days this year. And I believe our third half day is on Friday, which is my last day as a senior in high school. Um, so I, I, I really think that these are gonna, these, these have been incredible for our students. I haven't necessarily enjoyed them because I already have a half day, um, but for my peers and from our community members and, and, and teachers in our school building, I think this has been uh, very impactful and has made a positive impact in BCPS. So I hope the board will approve this. I love the dates. I love that the December 22nd one aligns with, with um, winter break. And I, I think this is good work. So. Yay, let's do it. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Mrs. Causey and then Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Um, so I had a question related to the early days off because um, I know um, when we did this last year, there were some issues with uh, activities, uh, different kinds of student activities and also athletics that were already planned on those half days. And it was not discussed, well, in the, uh, meeting, but then it came out later in the statement that all after school activities would be canceled. So I just wanted to clarify that um, if there are after school activities, which are voluntary for teachers and uh, to be involved with and athletics, the MPSSA, they schedule a year in advance. There may already be events um, that are scheduled or would be scheduled in those days that student activities and athletics could continue as needed and planned. So I just wanted to ask you that question. Well, they could, but the whole point is to give staff and students a break. And so what we did this year, we were implementing these early release once the calendar was established. And that included every, all the other different calendars. We're trying to stay ahead 
So as we look at these dates, we'll, we'll compare with other activities. You mentioned athletics, we'll compare with, with extracurricular activities. But keep in mind, the point is to release folks for a break, kind of like a, a, a mental break. And, and, and so we'll look at that. It, it, again, wouldn't preclude coaches or sponsors to have any activity, um, but it may defeat the purpose. Well, because there are some um, activities that are time to find, the holiday concerts, uh, plays, well, that's why things we are of that nature. Ahead of so the game. But again, if folks want to have their activity, they can have their activity. Again, this was overwhelmingly positive. Oh, no matter I, how I agree, many, but I'm how just... many concerns about rearranging the, the concerts and so forth, the mere fact that folks were tired. And, and so, yes, Ms. Calls, we'll take that in consideration and we'll work with our, our sponsors and extracurricular activity sponsors and coaches. Um, that's, that's the best I can give you at this time. Okay, but it won't be all activities are canceled after. I can't, I can't say that at this time. I want to give the staff and students breaks. They've been asking for breaks. Oh, we can I understand, but do this. the majority of these are volunteer. They're... I'm just, I'm responding to your question. Okay. That's well, the, that's I won't the be best able to vote can... on it since I, I it, if there can't be a clear answer. No, there's an answer. Let me just clarify. There's an answer that folks have options but the whole point of this is to give folks a gift of time and a break. So we will look at the scheduling, but there's options. That's the best answer I can give to you at this time. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. So is there an impact on the calendar for the half days at all? There was not. So for hours, none of that has to be made up. Okay, and I think for the other day, um, whatever Mr. Duke comes back with to vote on that, I need the answer about snow days because adding days to the end of the calendar, or if we don't have to add days to the end of the year because it's snow days, then it makes something like this a, a whole day off easier. So that it was partly why I brought that up. Okay, thank you. So there's a motion, and I believe it was seconded. Should have been seconded, correct? On the floor. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Jose? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Hen? Yes. Favor seven? So the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I did have one um, additional question, and I, I'm looking to see if any other board members had questions regarding this agenda item, and it was regarding the website, and that is to ask about our student data privacy section and whether or not that content, there are plans to restore that content, which was lost in the ransomware attack, specifically um, the parent section on growing up digital. Um, this incorporated the COSIN data privacy toolkits, um, as well as information on um, student data privacy and data sharing information for each of our tools that students use. And there was a wealth of information for parents around that. And I'd like to know what the plans are as we rebuild the website for engaging with families around this, because that was a very helpful site. 
if Thank someone you for could that question, that. Ms. Hen. We can certainly look into that and um, get back to you on information that we're able to locate and build up and make sure that we're sharing those helpful resources once again with our community. And I will also ask our chief information officer to work collaboratively yes. with you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Hen? Yes. Um, Who is that? Mac? Yes. Go ahead, Miss Mac. I would like to make a motion that we move item M to the beginning of the next board meeting. Oh. Since it's an important item and we are losing um, board members and staff members, um, and I think we need to give it the right amount of time. I'll second that. Thank you, Ms. Mack. I, too, would support that. In fact, you, um, I just put a motion in the chat oh. um, asking for a motion to postpone items M and O to the next board meeting. Would you consider withdrawing your motion and making that motion? Yes. Um, and by way of just you, alerting everybody, I hit some button, and when I do respond to you, it's going to say urgent, so I apologize. No worries. <laughs> Mr. McMillian, yes. you... Um, yes, I agree to that. Okay. And so, Ms. Mack, you move. And Mr. McMillian, would you second that motion? Yes. Thank you. Any discussion, board members? Yes. yes. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Just that... I, are there staff members present right now that have been waiting to present this? Is Dr. Williams? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, I don't feel, I think we should just go along with the presentation that I don't want to have our staff members coming in at the next board meeting if they've been sitting through this whole board meeting just to present this presentation. So I want to respect our staff and I think that we should have this presentation even though it's getting late. I, I want to respect their time and them giving up their evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to comment on this as well. I, I agree with Ms. Mack that this topic is too important for the hour. Um, it needs the time that it deserves. It needs the presence of the full board. Several members have already departed, and we we need to um, reschedule it and give it the, the priority and the time and the attention that it warrants. So I, I will be supporting this motion and would request that it be um, moved to the next board meeting. And if we can to move it earlier in the agenda to avoid this from from recurring. Um, any other discussion before I call a, um, the vote? Ms. Hen. Hearing not? Yes. Just want to remind the board that we do have information on our website uh, regarding our climate and culture, the work that we've done. So I would offer that you look at that. I would offer that you look back in all the town hall meetings that we have conducted. And our next board meeting is June 14th. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The Hager motion seven. carries. Thank you. I just, I just want to thank the staff for who were scheduled to present for staying um, to this very end. Uh, we will look at agenda setting to make sure um, you will not be here this late. Time. So thank you, Dr. Zarchin and April Lewis, Dr. Yarbrough. Yes, likewise. Um, the board appreciates, appreciates your staying and um, regrets the, the inconvenience and the, the late start that led us to, to have to postpone this item. This brings us to Item N, which is information. These items include the final report on key school legislation, the financial report for March 2022, quarter three audit report, 
revised superintendent rules 4006, 5120, and 5580, and new superintendent's rule 5480. The last item on the agenda is announcements. Because no one has signed up to provide public comment, the FY 2024 capital budget hearing has been canceled for tomorrow, May 18th, 2022. Comments may still be sent to the board at BOE at bcps.org for consideration. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, June 14th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you all for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Have a good evening. Thank you.